All right, welcome back everyone to the 15th Collective Intelligence Block Party and this two hour segment with Dr. Silas Rao and other guests um, as we delve into K Mama, Food Healers, Operation Stone Soup, etc. Um, I'll just put in my two cents while I got the mic and then I'm going to pass it to, to Silas to really lead and really set the context for the meeting and whatnot. Um, and, but my two cents is, just like we did last week, we started with the conversation. How do we save life on earth? The big picture conversation. And <clears throat> that everything we do be toward that, and how do we form a strategy of the whole? We were commenting on the previous meeting with Will Tuttle about how, when I met you, Silish, and uh, many of the folks in, in your, com your beautiful community that you've assembled over the years, um, I was like, wow, this is so amazing. This is super cool. And I was coming from a place where SRM, cooling the planet, is the number one priority. It's like, how do we marry the two of those? So for me, the, what I'm calling the hyper solution, which is like a really big basket of solutions, including strategy um, of Operation Stone Soup, which includes solar radiation management, which includes collective superintelligence, and many and many other good things. That's at the level at which I think we should focus first is big high level strategy and then get into details. But again, that's my two cents. Having said that, happy to talk more about that when you think it's appropriate, uh, Silish. And I, at this point, love to pass it to you. And I'm standing by to help in any way I can and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So over to you, Silish. Welcome. We love you so much, Silish. Thank you so much for bringing us all together and being such a powerful, wonderful pillar of this uh, community. Thank you so much. Welcome, Silas. Thank you, Jamin. Uh, thank you all for being here. This is, this is incredible. Uh, I just got through uh, with an hour long call with uh, uh, Ari Ben David from Israel, who is also thinking about these things and is also thinking about creating an app. And he's already created an app uh, called Share It, where he's uh, getting people to have an informal economy and uh, around sharing things. So just like we've been talking about K-Mama. And uh, so, so it's great, you know, and he's also been uh, thinking about it from a systems perspective. So he's going to go take a look at our white paper and see how we can all come together. Because he already has a community of a few thousand people working with him on this. And so, yeah, I think food is where it is. Food is uh, absolutely the place where we need to rebuild the system and rebuild the system around healthy food, healthy immune boosting food that's available for free to people so that it is, um, so that that base is taken care of because I see all these reports about People in Guatemala, you know, walking around with white flags to indicate that they are hungry, and different colored flags with diff for different needs. But you know, white flag is hungry. Uh, people in India also suffering from hunger, all because the system is designed to uh, just dribble things from the top down, and it's now you know making people all sit at home, not do anything and subject themselves to this. So it's awful. So we need to rebuild it. Rebuilding it as, and I think uh, I'm beginning to really like your idea of bifurcation, the marketing bifurcation. Uh, how about making that, uh, making a statement like that, you know, that, that we need to have healthy food available to people for free. And this should be the, objective of the community is to ensure that that is available to people. Good water, healthy food, these are basic rights that everyone should have. So on the app itself, we have received a working version now. So I have been playing with it. There are some things that uh, need to be tweaked. So they're working on that. But otherwise, I'm, I'm just terribly pleased that, you know, I thought, Developing an app takes a long time, but these guys seem to be able to do it very quickly. So things are working, you know, things are going into the database and coming out. And so 
uh, I'm now playing uh, the the admin role and taking a look at it on 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 our server. So foodhealers.org is now up and running. Foodhealers.org, um, at least the server is up and running, and it now has a secure socket layer implemented on it. So it is. Uh, um, so so everything is coming into place, you know, for the food healers. Uh, meanwhile, I think the need needs in the community is growing. I mean, uh, even with the, the reopening of the economy that has happened, I'm finding that a lot of people don't have jobs anymore because the jobs got removed in the meantime. So in Tempe, they were saying that they're giving away a food basket every minute. That's how much the need is. So it, uh, uh, the need for the app is still there. Is very much uh, need of the hour at the moment. So that's my update. So we can then throw it open for discussions, questions, whatever. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Silish. What a powerful update. Um, I love the focus you're bringing to it. We got Miles with his hand raised, followed by Jamin. And feel free to raise your hand if you want to get in the queue or just type your name in the chat window or just wave at me or whatever. Um, go for it, Miles. Yeah, I'm just turning these on. I think I did better. So, is it working? Yeah. Oh, yeah, just fine, Miles. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, um, Oh, si Silas, so, we're getting some background noise there. From you. What I wanted to say the other day, I was thinking of this ad old adage, and I think it's you know, possibly from engineering, and that is if you have a problem that you need to solve, 80% of the work needed to solve the problem is actually to accurately define the problem. And so in Facebook, I posted, I said, you know, Dr. Rao and the scientists who produced the data and the people that produced the data that you use to write your white paper, that 80% um, of getting to the solution has been done. The heavy lifting has been done with the culmination of this white paper. But it occurred to me that indeed, it's not just 80% of the work has been done. I would say 99.9% .9 of the work has been done. Because the only thing anyone has to do now, because you've written the white paper, is to write their shopping list, their grocery list. That's a pretty simple document to create. And it just has to be a vegan shopping list, grocery list. And then I'm th thinking as you were speaking, how about connecting this concept of the white paper, the next grocery list, and we create a community grocery list and say, okay, this week we're going to get together and we're going to make these seven dishes over the next seven days and we'll have a Zoom, Zoom gatherings for people to come together and cook these delicious vegan meals together. And I don't know if that kind of a concept could be connected into the K-Mama app as well. You know, and so the, the, if we communally got together on Zoom with this shared grocery list and meal planning, um, at the same time, the K-Mama app kicks in and we, everybody who's participating is also kicking in free meals to give to somebody else. So just put those out for your consideration. All righty. Any comments, Silas, or shall I proceed? Um, well, you... 
Yeah. I mean, that's an awesome idea. I have to think about how we would incorporate that within the uh, app. But yeah, it's an awesome idea. Beautiful. And um, I'm next in the queue and I don't see anyone after me. So feel free to jump in the queue. Um, I, I love what you said, Miles, about 80% of the work is in, is in defining the problem. So, and um, uh, my definition of the problem, uh, here's my contribution to the 80%, is that it's about saving life on earth, holistically in the big, in the big sense, and that our main threats right now are crop failures due to planetary overheating, uh, sea level rise, storms, just extreme climate change due to planetary overheating, um, uh, pandemics, hunger associated with the crop failures, um, and uh, you know just loss of life generally, the sixth mass extinction. This is th that's the problem, and so the solution. Um, and given the time scale of the problem, another element of the of the definition of the problem is the time scale. You know, do we have 50 years to solve this or five years or five months? What, what do we got? Well, I would, Guy McPherson is predicting crop failures as early as this fall, massive crop failures, right? And this really strikes at, at, our, at the heart of our ability to, to survive on the planet. And so, in terms of our time scale, we probably have on the order of months to implement planetary scale solar radiation management, which is at best number, you know, three, four, or five on the list of priorities. Right now we've got pandemics and hunger at the top and going whole food, right? Plant-based, uh, immune boosting. Well, we package all those together with, with feeding everyone and we, we, we solve those big three, but that, leaves solar radiation management, which is why I go back to. Um, if, if, if I'm defining the problem correct, correctly, then we need to have the conversation first um, and figure out the best way in which the food piece can fit into that and also respect overall timing, right? We've been at this conversation for a few weeks now and our time scale is months. Um, and that's why I, I push for and we need to do, and we will do, we just need to continue having the conversation, which is what we'll spend the next literally, you know, 20 hours or so until the early morning hours talking about um, the overall strategy. How do we do this, right? Imagine a press conference in which we announce not only the K-Mama app and food healers and Silas, your white paper, and you take the lead. You are the, the main, you know, the main character there. You introduce uh, Dr. Priya Naik and her medical team. You introduce me when appropriate. But imagine that the message of the press conference is literally the whole of it, including the urgent need to cool the planet through planetary scale SRM. And that therefore, we urgently need to do the following things simultaneously. We need to feed everyone. And you know more about that, da, 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 here's all the logistics. We need to come together as a planetary collective superintelligence. And we need to apply that collective superintelligence to do what most people today in today's reality would argue is impossible, to do millions of square miles of reflective uh, surface deployment around oceans primarily and to a much lesser extent deserts. Um, and also ice caps uh, significantly with solutions like ice911.org. But all these planetary scale SRM solutions, get them rolling like in a matter of months, that seems impossible. But with, with collective superintelligence, it's entirely possible. So the definition of the problem leads me to both an urgency and a mindset of uh, the time for half measures is over, right? Because if we only solve half the problem, you know, the food and pandemics, and don't get on the ball on SRM right now, ASAP, we will have solved half the problem and we'll be dead in, you know, a couple of years or so. And it'll be a miserable death because of crop failures. Not because we didn't organize ourselves as best we could in terms of food distribution, but because we didn't solve the other half of the problem, which is planetary overheating, right? So... I want to. I just want to say that and put it on the table, and I'd love to hear other people's thoughts about that, because we've got to solve the whole problem, and we've got to not be satisfied with, hey, we did this, and wow, this is wow, oh my goodness, we're up to millions of, you know, and then boom, the big Monty Python foot comes down and pff, 
crushes the whole, you know, parade because we didn't attend to the planetary overheating, right? And, and one could say, well, sure, but, you know, we're focused just on this part. And, but the whole separation of the world into parts is at the root of the problem. We've got to stop doing that. And we've got to recognize that we are the grown-ups in the room. Why do I say that? Because we're the people in the room. We're the people in the conversation, right? So we need to take responsibility for Mother Earth. Literally all of us in this room and those who aren't in this room who will be joining us. But we need a hyper solution, including a meta strategy that takes us through all the phases in the next several weeks. And it has to be, um, you know, I mean, this is, this, is, this is without any question in my mind, the greatest undertaking humanity will have ever undertaken over the course of its history. And we've got to act really fast. So that's why I say, let's focus on the press conference because once we launch that, we'll get the collective super intelligence from the world. The world will come pouring in. Anyway, I've spoken for quite a bit there. So I'm gonna mute myself. Uh, no one's in the queue. And so Silish, by default, I hand it to you. Yeah, um, I hear you, Jamin, but I think from a larger perspective, we need to, we need to sort of frame it as remediation and regeneration of the planet. Um, something that everyone can get behind, you know, it's about remediation and regeneration of the planet that involves cleaning up uh, chemical pollution. It involves, you know, cleaning up the water, purifying the water. So there is a water law that Shelley wants to propose you know, that um, uh, get every government to start cleaning up all their rivers and all their streams. And, and so that should be their main, one of their focuses. Right now, their focus is on how to remove all regulations so we can pollute as much as possible because it's all about you know, growing the economy, okay? So uh, this is, uh, again, you know, we, need to, we need to then use technology that we have come up with I mean, that we know that would um, make plants a little more resilient to, to what's happening so that we can grow things. So, uh, I mean, the industrial way of growing things is, uh, that's, going, that's going to be the failure that he is talking about, that Guy McPherson is talking about. But, um, so we've been, you know, I was talking to Ben, um, Ari Ben David about ways to grow plants, you know, even when things are going bad out there. So when you have, um, it, drought conditions. Even then you can get plants to grow if you ration your water properly and if, if you make sure that the water is getting to the roots of the plants properly. And these are things that Sadhana Forest has done, you know, people are, uh, in Israel have done because they have they've sort of used that uh, to, for the past few decades actually. So they've sort of refined it, you know. And um, so these are things that we need to know spread throughout the world so people understand how to take care of their plants so that we don't get into this um, hunger issue. The food failure is the number one issue that we need to address. And making our food system more resilient. And uh, following that, you know, we can, I mean, uh, people will come together around other things. That's our first challenge, I think. Gotcha. T totally hear you, Silish. Um, we've got Miles in the queue, followed by uh, Sarah. Um, I first wanted to comment that in terms of crop failure, the main driver of that that Guy McPherson is predicting is not water shortage, but simply temperature, that plants cannot live above a certain temperature. And the temperature spike that we are staring down the barrel of could be as high as 10 to 12 degrees centigrade additional temperature spike above where we're at right now. So we're, we're talking about a hot earth that simply cannot sustain life in anywhere near, you know, the numbers that we have, right? You know, maybe somebody will be growing cabbages on Iceland or something, right? And, and hanging in there in, in this new hot earth scenario. But we're talking about a, a world that might support, you know, tens of millions, but not, you know, the 8 billion of us who are. So. If we want to avoid this massive 
human-induced Holocaust, we've got to bring SRM into the picture. It's not just about saving water and working with plants. They become more resilient and all that. And this gets back to the definition of the problem. You know, are, are, we, are, are, we live, are we living in a reality where the problem is defined as, oh, you know, as Al Gore says, you know, by 2100, it could be a couple degrees centigrade higher. No, no, no. By, you know, as little as, I don't know, three to five years from now, we could be multiple degrees centigrade higher than we are right now and all of us dead, right? Um, and, and so in defining the problem, I think we need to, we need to get clear on this, right? right. What, what problem are we really solving? So thank you for your support there. So I, I'd like everyone to, to address that. Um, Silas, since I just responded to what you said, I, I'm, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to respond if you, if you, if you wish, or I can hand it over to Miles. No, I mean, uh, the, um, if we trigger all these feedback loops that he's talking about, uh, but it's not clear if this already happened, right? We see things happening, but I don't see an in, in, uh, instant spike in the temperature yet. But uh, yeah, if we see a one degree Celsius increase in temperature in one year, of course, people are going to be putting every mirror that's out there you know, and trying to reflect sunlight back. Uh, that's, I think that's where the panic will set in. And, uh, but right now, there is clearly hungry people. And that, so that panic has to be taken care of first. Right. No, the, 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 Silas, there's no question in my mind that we need to feed people first. And, and Miles and Sarah, I appreciate your patience, but this is, I, I feel this is really, really important that we get clear on this. Um, so in, in the press conference that I envision, it's all about feeding everyone. Let's say we do it in Brooklyn, New York. It's called Brooklyn Eats. It's part of Operation Stone Soup. It's about feeding the whole world. You know, here's all these different perspectives on it. Here's all these conversations that are in progress. But just like the story stone soup, we're focusing on the beginning, the starting point, not on the whole. For the whole of it, we need you. Yes, you, whoever's watching, whoever's listening, whoever's watching on CBS News or all the networks are going to be covering this. So this is our opportunity to tell the world we need you here now. So to do what? To feed Brooklyn and then feed the world. Within Feeding Brooklyn, we build the model to feed the world. We export that model, but we also get the world's participation through collective superintelligence in building the model in Brooklyn. So even if you're in Iceland, join us in Brooklyn virtually, et cetera, et cetera. But it's all about feeding everyone. And in the process, building the collective superintelligence just in time to put out, to, to, to cool the planet through SRM. And it's something that you, we really have to be forward looking because by the time we get to the, essentially the vertical phase of the exponential, right now we're in the knee, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's enough fake news and, and supposed controversy that, you know, a lot of, it's, it's, it's easy for a lot of people, unfortunately, to say that the situation is not clear. It's crystal clear. If you look at the facts and if you look at the 67 self-reinforcing feedback loops that Guy McPherson has documented over the decades, um, we are dangerously close to going vertical. Once we start going vertical, it is such a slippery slope. If you consider crop failures, starvation, right? Mad Max, right? At that point, we won't have an economy or anything like the civilization or anything like the order that we have now. Not to say that it's a good order, but it is an order, right? Without, if we go to the Mad Max disorder, all bets are off in terms of, of, of stopping the exponential planetary overheating. So we need to be proactive. But, but the cool thing is, we're all in agreement that we need to feed people first. And the reason I say that is twofold. Number one, it prevents Mad Max, stops pandemic, but also crucially forms the collective superintelligence that we need to go after SRM within the time frame that we have. Getting back to the definition of the problem. Okay, I, I don't want to dominate, but back to you, Silas, and then let's give it over to Miles and Sarah. Go on, I'm now let Miles speak. Okay, thank you very much. So what I was thinking is that, um, and Shankar mentioned this in the last vegan collective intelligence solutionaries group gathering. Now I'm in Canada and just for the record, I drop in on the social club because I'm not in business with anybody here. <laughs> But I appreciate the public sharing and the learning that you always are putting out there in your recording. So Shankar asked this 
and he said, well, should we not be reaching out to the existing companies and organizations who are providing goods and services? And right, yeah, how about you get your Vegan World 2026 branding, your climate healers branding, plus the white paper out to everybody, even the engineering companies, the glass and mirror manufacturing people, uh, all the procurement logistics companies, and say, this is the white paper and this is where we're at. And we're going to be feeding people um, in Brooklyn. But how about this? Why not Phoenix? You know, right now I'm in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. It's 40 degrees Fahrenheit, nice and cool. But I know, I've heard, I, I'm blown away when I hear that in Phoenix, the aircraft are sinking into the tarmac, the asphalt, because it's so hot in Phoenix at times. So Phoenix is probably the number one place to take this message because you guys need this cooling more than anybody in the world down there in Phoenix. Um, you know, but uh, Brooklyn's a fantastic city too and has the vegan mayor. So, you know, all these are great ideas. But anyway, in summary, this press conference would be a release of of, of a call for affiliates. Anybody who's any doing anything who thinks, oh yeah, this is serious. I'm an engineering firm. I'm manufacturing building windows and those reflective materials already. I'm, I'm manufacturing the potato chip bags that Jamin talked about. Um, and oh, these people in this press conference are announcing they want to have an affiliation with Vegan World 2026. Hey, I'm calling you guys up. I want to get in on this. Thank you. Good stuff, Miles. Really good stuff. There, there's yeah, there's there's so much to to explore here. I'm just so grateful for this meeting because it's through this process that we get it all worked out right and uh sarah's had her hand up followed by my brother melvin all right sarah go for it my question is for operation stone soup will that reach out to the navajo nation because i read an article just the other day that the navajo nation there's a lot of people have being displaced and a lot of them are living in New Mexico, but 40% of Navajo nation does not have electricity or running water. And that to me is just, I can't even conceptualize that right now because I can't even imagine anybody being in this country without water and or electricity just wanted to get your kind of feedback on that because of Brooklyn is important. Also, I think we have to think about the people that have always been displaced, the, you know, Navajo nation and they're just, I, I think they need food more than ever. I'm not sure. I, I think they get government subsidies, but I'd like maybe somebody to also answer that as well. Thank you. Yeah, I have been there, uh, Sarah. So, cause it's just not in Northern Arizona and you're right. Um, uh, a lot of people don't have electricity in their homes. It's all wired for electricity. There are lights in the home and all that. So some, they, you know, the government basically uh, gave contracts out to all these people who came and built these homes for them, uh, but they didn't finish the job. So there is no electricity to the home. But the Navajo Nation is the largest supplier of coal for the Navajo coal-fired power plant, which is... So which means they get all the pollution from the coal. And that coal, uh, that coal-fired power plant is uh, used to generate electricity to pump water from the Hoover Dam to Phoenix and to Tucson, Arizona. So literally their, their land, you know, we are taking coal from their land and, and burning that coal to, to serve us, but not them. So that's really what's going on. And um, yeah, they don't have running water. They, they, so they go out and they get water. And they, so they have all these pickup trucks because that nation is, I mean, it's pretty rugged. 
They don't have too many roads everywhere. So it becomes very muddy during the rainy season. And, uh, and they get boxes of food from the government, which is full of processed stuff. Which again is whatever corporation thinks is a good idea to put in the box for however much money they get from the government for that. So yeah, and, and so they have a lot of underlying um, um, pre-existing conditions that make them more susceptible to COVID-19. And so they pretty much have no choice but to suffer through it. And so that's what's happening now. And people are taking food up from uh, Phoenix to Navajo Nation now. Um, so like Community Kitchen is donating food. So if you are interested, you can donate to Community Kitchen and they will. So there is a cook from the Navajo Nation there. So who, who makes sure that the food does get to the Navajo Nation if you donate to them. I'll put the link up here so you can. All right, and while you're doing that, uh, Silas, if if you if you're done speaking, I'll I'll add. But up to you. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Okay. Um, so I, I also want to uh, add to that answer. Um, since Sarah, you you asked specifically about Operation Stone Soup in Brooklyn. Right, and you know, perhaps the relationship between Brooklyn and, and the Navajo Nation. I see a super strong relationship, which is as follows. You see, when we start this, we have to start it somewhere, right? And I'm glad uh, so from London is here in the meeting. She knows folks from Extinction Re uh, Rebellion, which started in London, and they felt very strongly that it had to start in the capital city. Well, uh, since we're doing something at a planetary scale, the capital city, the default capital of the planet is, is New York, the default. I'm not saying it's a great capital or anything like that. Um, I don't particularly like to be in New York. Uh, I do like to visit, sh brief visits, but not, not more than a few days. Um, so I'm not like pro New York or anything like that, but it, it, it is the default capital of the world. It's also the news media capital of the world versus LA, the entertainment media capital of the world. But those are the two media capitals. New York is news. And we need to get the news out to the whole world because quite frankly, once we do, then a whole community and collective intelligence can form around the Navajo Nation and getting them everything that they need. Super high priority as a First Nation people that have been brutally oppressed, almost extinguished. Um, and you know, it, it, so they absolutely need to be prioritized. But the beautiful thing is here, by forming this planetary collective intelligence, which can happen literally within hours, once we set our minds to it and our intention to it. So what I'm proposing is that the world set its attention to feeding everyone. And that way the entire world, no matter where they are, there will be climates around the world that are very similar to the Navajo Nation that are on entirely other continents with people who speak different tongues, but who can help the Navajo Nation because they've been through what, they've, what they're what they going through and they've learned some stuff and they can contribute it, All right? We have the technology for this. Thanks to you, Silish, and, and many, other, many other colleagues of yours um, over the years. So we have an opportunity to do this and I believe that our opportunity is to appeal to the world with this big whole solution Right, which spans, and I love, I love the banner of regeneration and remediation because solar radiation management fits conveniently under that super benevolent, uncontroversial umbrella, right? I would not use, for example, the word geoengineering, right? So we gotta frame it in the right way, and I love the way you're framing it, uh, Silas. So, um, but in order for us to inspire the world to come together as a planetary collective superintelligence, to solve this gargantuan problem in time, which is absolutely crucial. Um, I think the first step is that we ourselves inspire each other around the whole vision. So I'm appealing to everyone here that if you see the whole vision, that you please share it with the rest of this room. We need to start right here uh, before we go too much further. Um, Melvin's had his hand up, followed by Myra, and then I'd like to volunteer so, if, if I may, to, <laughs> to jump in with your Extinction Rebellion experience, I just wanted you to be able to add to that about the, the capital city and why that's so important. But oh, this is yeah. all a really great conversation. 
I don't have the answers or the truth or anything like that. I just have my perspective to add. So I add it as generously yeah. and as clearly and hopefully as concisely as I can, though I don't always. Um, one, one of the founders of Extinction Rebellion, um, Roger Hallam, recently gave a talk. And um, basically, Roger Hallam had been studying how to kick off a re revolution. So he's basically been studying previous revolutions. He made that his area of study for his doctorate. And he tested each thing out. Like um, he, you know, got behind all the cleaners who were on strike at, at the university. Um, he caused, you know, he was acting all this stuff out. So he was studying it, it was in his head, and then it was on the ground, in his head, on the ground. But he said, when it came to Extinction Rebellion, the, the big thinking about London was, although um, as a group, they'd been around all the little towns all over UK, the pokey little towns where farmers live, to give this talk about the six mass extinction, the urgency to, to deal with issues, to deal with the climate. So he, he got them to sign a pledge at, at these meetings to say that, they would be willing to come and block all the bridges in London. Now, the thinking behind the blocking the bridges in London was his thinking after all his research and that was it had to be super audacious, massively audacious, like protest on steroids. So they didn't know if anyone was going to turn up on these, but they could have signed the pledge and not turned up. So anyway, it had to be the capital, even though he'd been get it they've been trying to get people from all over the uk it had to be the capital because in the case of london the capital is where the politicians are this is where our parliament is that isn't the case for you because yours is over in washington however it's the capital of the media it's the capital of the density of population and the forward thinking it's the camp so you've got a lot of footfall um it's the capital of money billionaires are living in those flats on park avenue so you know that that that's why it has to be you know it's it's pumped up on steroids this protest and it has to be that location so and they did actually pull it off um so so that's a bit of history thank you thank you so i appreciate that very much um we've got melvin in the queue followed by myra followed by ray unless i'm missing anyone and i don't think i am let me know if it's otherwise. Uh, Melvin, brother, great to see you. And and I, I you got to unmute. I'll, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, I just okay, unmuted. Once again, I want to um, thank everyone for um, your contributions. And I just feel really honored to be a part of um, this discussion, uh, this transformation. You know, I was listening to Will, and I'm always listening to you, Jamin, and Salesh, and everyone else. And I just feel honored. And the, the conversations that we have and in the direction that we're going. <clears throat> but since we've been talking, I have um, always um, I was always Shelley's story of eco governance and whole system health and healing. I think in doing what we want to do, the story that we want to tell is as important or more important than the place where we start. The language that we use, the story that we tell. Um, I really like what Silas said about the remedi remediation and regeneration. That's the story we want to tell. And Shelley talks about whole system health and healing and eco-governance. And the the um, vitality code and the codes for a healthy earth. I really think that it's important that we have a cohesive language and a story that we tell. And Stone Soup is a beautiful story, but I think it would be and is part of the wider story of whole health healing. Whole system health and healing is part of that story and one of the things that i appreciate so much about Shelly is that she connects everything 
with the most vulnerable population. So as we telling this story by Stone Soup, I think it's important that we tell a story that we, that the most vulnerable population should have priority. And we know who that is, that's the animals and poor people of color. So I think it's very important that we're pointing and pointing out that who has priority are the most vulnerable populations. And that is animals and poor people and particularly poor people of color. And that we're talking about whole system health and healing and eco-governance. And we, you know, the principle of eco-governance is that the only legitimate purpose of governance is to protect and cultivate the health and vitality of the earth and all the inhabitants on earth. And we also talk about management and social systems. So in going forward, I think it's very important that we have a cohesive language. And with stone soup, it's a beautiful uh, uh, um, thing that we want to do, want to, but I think it's important that we be very inviting and say that stone soup is about prioritizing the most vulnerable populations. And we talk whole health and health, that we actually be pointed and clear about that, that that's what we targeting the most vulnerable population. We talking about whole health, whole system health and healing. And we also, it's important that as we going forward, that we talk about what type of governance, because we hear a lot, there, there's a lot of solutions. There's really a lot. I think many people have identified, identified the problem. Many people have identified the problem. We're not the first one, Salesh, you or no one else is the first one to identify the problem. But what we have to come with is the cohesive, a cohesive story that we want to tell it and how we're going to solve that problem. And the best one that I've heard thus far is whole systems health and healing because it's so inclusive <clears throat> and so inclusive. And it goes down to what we really want to do, saving this whole earth and not leaving out any part of it. And it, 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 it really captures everything that we want to do. And also what Silesh is talking about, the seven core shifts that we need to make. That is also within the whole system's health and healing. And what you're talking about, Jamin, the RM, is that my pronouncing it? The RM, the 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 rate the cool cooling the earth. SRM, solar yeah, radiation that's management. That's SRM. That's RM. And in and and in, in, in the soup, the hint stone soup. All of that, to me, falls on the whole system health and healing. So what I'm saying as we going forward, I think we could save ourselves a lot of time if we don't try to reinvent the wheel about the story that we want to tell. Somehow integrate our, in our language, in our conversation, what Shelly and what Silesh is saying about the seven core shifts and what you're saying. And I think that that's, that's extremely important, you know, that, that we do that. Because one of the things I like about eco-governance is that you, it's self-governing and self-regulating systems that we have to, on, on, a, on a local and a global level. And that's the story that we want to tell the people in, 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 uh, 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 in the Bronx and on the Navajo reservation that we're talking about having self-regulating, self-governing system where there's no central authority um, telling you what to do or you're not trying to follow an ideology or some type of leader. We're talking about creating, you're developing self-regulating and self-governing systems here in your ecosystem to control it. I mean, in your ecosystem to, to go forward. We really have to start thinking about how we can best contribute to um, a healthy ecosystem, a healthy environment, healthful ecosystem, and healing the planet for everyone. And once again, I really, I haven't done as much reading as perhaps some of you. I don't have as much as experience. But I think what Shelley wrote, 
with Eco Governance, Whole System Health and Healing, Eco Governance, the Vitality Code, and uh, uh, the Code for a Healthy Earth. I think that kind of wraps everything up in a way where no one, where it includes everyone. I have a, the mayor right here in Tempe, just one election. I had a conversation with him and I shared with him eco-governance, whole system health and healing. This guy's eyes just opened up. I said, this is a story, Corey, this is a story you have to tell. And that way you won't get any, when you talk about whole system health and healing, and you talking to as a mayor and, if, and you're in the platform, you're not gonna get any pushback, much pushback. When you say, well, we got to think about whole system health and healing, not just this one side over here. And that brings, cause we got a lot of groups with individual efforts and we have to bring everybody under the same tent. And I, I don't know of any better way to bring anybody under the same tent except by telling a cohesive narrative. And that narrative is about whole system health and healing in those seven core shifts that Silesh is talking about. So just want to put that out there. And Jamin, I really want to thank you so much. And I, I watching you evolve. I heard you mention uh, whole systems health in, 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 in your dialogue and everything since we've been having this here. I, I'm telling you, I'm listening to you. I, I heard you mention that. And that's, that's the story we have to tell. And as I said, I was recently introduced to system, whole system thinking and, and what reductionist science is. I was recently introduced to that. Man, Will Sniff, Will, with Dr. Tuttle, he really nailed it on the head. So going forward, we want to tell the story about whole system health and healing and talk about how pernicious reductionist system model of thinking is. I think if we could do those two things, it would help people to have more clarity. And we need really we really need clarity in the whole systems thinking, whole system perspective give clarity. And it also comes up with different solutions. So what I'm just saying again, I'm not being redundant. Part of our language, and we're talking to individuals, a group here, I'm encouraging that we start talking about systems thinking. See, we don't, maybe we don't say whole system. We have to, I think it's important that we talk about system thinking and we also have to throw in there reductionist, reductionism and give examples of that. So when other people hearing it, they'll know really where we're coming from. And it also helps them to develop more clarity and, and to understand their positions a lot better when we look at things from a system perspective. Ashe. Beautiful, Melvin. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I can see from Silas's face that he couldn't agree with you more either. Um, and I, I want to thank you because, um, you know, and, and also acknowledging my own evolution because, you know, rewind Jamin Shively two years ago, I was just like SRM, SRM, gotta cool the planet, SRM, you know, I was just an SRM robot, right? And, um, you know, oh, what's for lunch? Uh, bacon cheeseburgers? Fine. Uh, you know, and then let's talk about SRM while we eat. You know, it was just all about SRM. And um, then I met Silish. It's just like, whoa, right? And, you know, my world just started to shift and change. And then I put the two together, SRM with veganism, and we came up with vegan reflection, right? It's like, cool, cool. So think of that as just like two cells coming together, right? And forming a two cell organism. Well, per what you're saying, Melvin, what we need to do is create a multi-cell organism. And in fact, I'm gonna take that one step further and call it an omni-cell organism, meaning all cells, all people, all of our brother and sister species. When you say whole system, I think you're talking about the whole planet, right? Right, okay, that, I'm, I'm with you, right? At some point we might expand it to the whole solar system, the whole galaxy, all of life in the universe. But I think right now, if we start with the whole planet, I think that's a good starting point. So we're speaking exactly the same language, well, Melvin, brother. More specifically, we talk about how we want to organize our lives. More specifically, how we're going to organize. It's not just 
uh, a concept. It's about how we're going to organize our lives. And that's the important thing. How we, what type of system, organizational structure do we have on place? Like, whether we want to accept it or not, all social system is about how people are going to survive on this earth. How you're going to get food, how you're going to get water, family, everything is how you want to organize your, your life. And, and, and it's about using resources. How are we going to reuse, how are we going to utilize the resources? And one of the, 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 the narratives in eco-governance is just specifically about that. How are we going to use the resources? So if we make changes and we don't have a conscious and deliberate model or organizational principle about how we're going to use the resources, we're going to have more of the same. More of the same. So it's not just a concept or a theory. It's something practical that should guide how we're going to organize, just like on the Navajo Reservation. I wouldn't dare go out there and suggest anything to them other than eco-governance, because it'd be more of the same. It would just be more of the same. You know, and that's the thing. We have to tell different stories and show people how they have the power to control their destiny and control their environments. They're where they are because of the current system. The only way life is going to get better there is a whole different organizational structure. And we have to start telling that story. How are we going to do that? Because again, all of us know what the problem is. Many of us know what the problem is. Even uh, uh, the CIA, uh, 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 the, the think tank, the intelligentsia, but they know what the problem is. They know how this, the, the scientists are paid to destroy this like uh, a will tell you. could take science and prove anything. So they pay their science to prove that climate change is not bad. They take their science to prove that animal agriculture is not they take their science to prove that the water is not being proved. They take their science and prove that milk is good for you. So we have to start telling a different story. You know, and, and, and that story is about, you know, like I, like I said, this is new to me and I, it resonates with me so strongly because I know that we have to create a new way of organizing our lives and stories that we have to start telling our children and the young people because they are hungry for something. They are really hungry for something. Even my daughters, when I told them about uh, 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 the principle of eco-governance, uh, uh, they latched on to it. And one of my daughters always talking about, it. now she always talking about complimentary because I told her how nature is, you know, this, this normal narrative that nature is just competitive. You got the lion, the king, and certain animals dominate. And I said, no, every, and everything is in nature is in a complementary relationship. The lion don't run anything in the jungle. He's just one little species out there, you know, and, and, and now they got that. Before that, they didn't have that, and they were really entrenched into, well, like, like Will was saying, how we are taught and, and believe in evolution and, and this model of science. That's just one example of how I shared that one thing about complimentaries to my daughter. And they're thinking that it's still a long way to go and I'm introducing them more and more to uh, uh, eco-governance, the vitality code. And it's given them a frame of reference to look at things different. Like this movement in um, London, it was great, but it's ended up more of the same. Where everyone needs, I'm sorry, we should all have a coherent story that we tell and which way we're going and what we want the world to look like. How do we want to organize our lives? And I think uh, Shelly and Salesh has laid it out. And what you're saying, Jamin, about the, the, the heating, the cooling of the earth, the stone soup, Everything you're saying, folks, is right in there. It's how we tell the story that we must prioritize the most vulnerable population. Ashe. Melvin, I just 
want to respond briefly, and we got three three other folks in the in the queue. But some of the stuff you said is so spot on. Um, you know, just listening to you right now, when you're saying, you know, prioritizing the most vulnerable, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like, I felt like bzz, bzz inside my brain because the, the Brooklyn Eats program, as we've currently framed it, does not prioritize just the most vulnerable. It goes after everyone. And so that's creating the bzz, bzz, wait a second. And so what I, here's what I'm thinking. So for me, the way to the synthesis of the two is to say, hey, how about this? Very simple. Start in Brooklyn with the most vulnerable in Brooklyn. Not everybody in Brooklyn, just the most vulnerable. Start like that, right? The goal is to get to everyone and then invite the world. Identify your most vulnerable communities in your community, in your larger community, your city, your town, your county, your state, your country, wherever, where, whatever you define as your community. Identify the most vulnerable and get to work and work with us, communicate with us. And I also really appreciate your um, bringing up the vitality codes and whole system health and healing and eco governance as laid out by, you know, by, by Dr. Shelley and Jan and Silish and, and, and everyone um, that's, that's involved in that. Um, and that's a big group. And I would love to see Shelley and Jan at the press conference whether physically or probably more likely through Zoom, but hey, we're, we're all Zooming these days, so it's, it's not a problem. Um, and because that's, we're, we're, we're literally speaking the same language, brother, which is we got to look at the whole. Miles nailed it when he said the definition of the problem. It's the whole system, right? So I think the press conference, basically, if, if, I, were, if I were Silas's speechwriter, which I'm not, I'd love to volunteer to be that, um, but that's up to Silish. But if I were Silish's speechwriter, this the opening words at the press conference would go something like this, and I'm glad we're recording right now. <laughs> um, which is, um, we got a lot of problems, and we need to solve them all. Starting with the most urgent. The most urgent is that everyone eat, right? And since we're going to solve that problem, we're going to solve it holistically which means whole food plant-based immune boosting, as Dr. Priya Knight and her medical team will discuss, who I will introduce shortly. Back to the big picture. It starts with food, but it doesn't end with food. It's food, the right kind of food, right? Again, I'll defer to the doctors, but basically to steal their thunder a little bit, it's what's best for the human, but also what's best for the planet. And so there's really two big reasons why you know, we need to go whole food, plant-based immune boosting. Good for people, good for the planet. Simple as that. Um, and now with the urgency of, of pandemics, there's simply no debate anymore. So we're doing it. Boom, that's number one. Number two, looking at the whole system. If that's the most urgent, what's the next most urgent? Cooling the planet. The house is on fire, right? We're burning up. We won't be able to grow any food anymore if we let this continue. So that's second most urgent. Third most urgent is, and then, you know, we'll write the rest of that speech later. Therefore, here we are with a very clean invitation to the world. World, join us on foodhealers.org. Join the conversation. There's a schedule of our Zoom video conferences. Everyone is welcome. Join the collective intelligence. It starts today. Join us. Bam! And let the world go to foodhealers.org and let them see Dr. Shelley Ostroff, if I'm pronouncing her name right, and codes for a healthy earth and all this and da, 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 and welcome. We're taking the whole system perspective. We're not solving half the problem. We're not solving a quarter of the problem. We're not solving the 1% of the problem for the wealthiest 1%, which is all the banks care about, right? No, we're solving 100% of the problem, not just for 100% of humans, but for 100% of species and ecosystems. We're solving the whole problem, right? Yes, Melvin. I'd just like to add one more point. As we're going forward in the language, I think it's very important that we specifically use the word racism when we talk about vulnerable population. Because if you just say we're going after vulnerable population, I can tell you poor black people are going to say that don't mean me. Poor people are going to just say you just talking about, you know, so it's very important that we use the word racism. I think it's also important that we use the language uh, speciesism, that we use very specific language where we 
colonialism, when we talk about vulnerable populations, we definitely, it's important that we say racism so that vulnerable population, we, they know we're talking to them. Just say vulnerable population, that's generic. They have to know that we're talking to them, that we feel their pain. When you say racism, you, you got their attention. You know, like Greta, as sharp as that young lady is, all the young black, young black females that I know say, that B.I.J. ain't talking to me. Because she don't say racism, <laughs> you know. But Greta mean well for them. If she would be more inclusive and say, well, we, we trying to, you know, fight against racism and all that. One of the tracks that Bernie's had for, for, for young black people, because he talked about racism. We got into racism. You know, so what I'm, my point is just that as we're going forward, we should consciously and deliberately say that one of the things that we, 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 we're against, we want to get rid of, is racism. We, we're, we're attacking, we know at the basis of racism, we know it's this hurting culture and the banking industry and blah, 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 all of that. But the most vulnerable population need to feel that we hear them and we know their, 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 their pain. I just want to add that to add that. Love it, Melvin, bro. Listen, every time I, every time I hear you talk, something clicks in my mind, something new. And um, Melissa has her hand up. It sounds like she wants to do a quick follow on. I'll, I'll call you in a sec, sweetheart. Um, but what I wanted to offer you, Melvin, is there's a program I've been wanting to launch for a long time now called Black and White. And I'd like to offer that we, we launch that, you and I and whoever else wants to join us. Black and white. And you know what? Bam. We get, we get right to the biggest racial divide that I know of, which is one people enslaving another people, transplanting them across a continent, right? Doing genocide on the people that were in this continent that they're bringing the enslaved people to, killing off the people who were here, bringing the slaves here and saying, here, do monoculture agriculture. So that's a black and white thing. And it also, I think it's a catchy title. And if they see a black elder and a white elder going at it in a good way, whoa, everyone will pay attention. This is the kind of media attention grabbing stuff that we got. Tell me that's not going to fly. Tell me that's not going to go crazy. And every, people are going to start watching it here, there, and everywhere. You got a black guy and a white guy finally talking about race, finally having a straight conversation about race. What happened? Right? What happened? And what I do we do now? To, I have to speak of race within a whole system context. You know, I, and I can't speak of it in any other way because when we do it without in a whole system context, we're doing it from a reductionist perspective. And like the civil rights struggle, it was just a re reductionist perspective. You go walk down the street and march, you get some change of law and everything was better. So when we talk about this here, race, we have to put it within a whole system context. When we talk about the, the um, um, Atlanta slave trade, I believe in telling the truth, the whole truth as best as I can. And the truth is that Africans were complicit in that. And we have to tell that story, but we have to tell it the right, we have to tell the, the truth and the whole truth and nothing to the truth because it was not uh, uh, many uh, uh, white guys running into interior Africa, grabbing other Africans, bringing them up to the coastline. It, it wasn't. So we need to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth that we're going to tell that story. Just like if we're going to tell about slave, we need to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth about it, you know, unvarnished. So when we talk about it, you know, I just want to put that in. Well, let's make that the topic of, uh, of episode one of Black and White. Let's call it the whole truth. And you lead it. No, seriously, you lead it. And you lead it with exactly what you just said. Look, we already recorded it, so we don't even need to do a take two. We splice that in. Boom. Here's boom. Melvin. Seriously, we got the technology, right? So that's it. Are you in, brother? Black and White? I have, I have, I want to do it, but I got so much burning right now. We were talking about the other day what's on my agenda. 
you and I were talking about it. All right, we'll, 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 we'll follow up later. I'm not here to put you on the spot because that would break a rule of the block party, which is to put people on the spot. We yeah. don't do that here. Well, anyway. I, you know, we talked about what one of my issues are yesterday. Uh, you muted yourself, bro. Here, I'm going to unmute you. Was I talking to you? A day before yesterday. Day before, day before you and I were talking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we were talking about it and uh, working on it. All right, you and I'll we'll follow up later on that. Okay, thank but you. One way or another, we're going to make this happen. Absolutely. All right. Love to. Love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you, Melvin, brother. So happy you're here. All right, we've got Myra, who's been waiting patiently, followed by Ray, followed by Sarah. Now, Melissa, I think you had a quick follow on. If it's quick, I, I'll let you jump the queue. Go ahead. Yeah, um, can you hear me okay? Yes, sweetheart. Okay. Um, I really wanted to thank Melvin for everything he just said, which really resonated with me. And having lived with the Haida, Simsian, and Clinket people for 14 years and seeing the genocide that still affects these tribes and, and of course, all First Nations people, um, I think you should probably call your group red, black, and white. And I think that we cannot leave indigenous voices out. One of the things that indigenous peoples um, have suffered is white domination and uh, terrible racism and being told how they need to live. So they become store dependent, uh, sugar dependent. They've been sold really bad food, processed food um, that has, you know, sugar, preservatives, pop, you know, it's potato chips, etc. cetera. And um, we've seen on the Northwest coast here um, a resurgence of First Nations cultures taking back their power and starting to live more traditionally. So schools in this area, um, they call themselves Indian schools, um, are teaching the children their songs and dances and how to cultivate their own food. So I think part of this program has to be about empowering people, whether they're people of color, so African-Americans, First Nations people, where they're actually getting to call their own shots rather than us telling them how they need to live because they've put up with that BS for way too long. And I think, um, so I've been working with an African-American artist here in, in the Seattle area on a public art project. And we talked a lot about climate change and the impact of that on uh, poor uh, neighborhoods. And one of the things he said to me is that his, people um they don't want they don't believe in it they they don't want to plant they don't want to they don't get climate change um so i think that was kind of an interesting comment coming from him but there is this whole um what he was explaining is that and and melvin maybe you can give me your uh, give us your feedback on this but he said there's a whole stigma around planting that is a negative stigma that came from the time of slavery here in this country. So there's this whole um, kind of ha coming together as all these different nations, all these different races, and how do we empower ourselves and others to, to make wise choices for themselves and their communities through learning again, holistic ways of being on this planet, which means honoring mother earth, planting our own food, a serving community, not just self, and getting out of the capitalist system, which is hurting everyone, and um, kind of flying off of what Will Tuttle said with us, spoke about today, you know, that um, really kind of coming back into sacred connection with the life around us and um, our own uh, cultures. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. I, I would like to thank you very much. Um, say something to the gentleman that said that about the planning in black communities. We have to understand that the African American or black community is not a homogeneous, you know, just community. You got all different types of, uh, of thinking going on. As a matter of fact, I grew up in a project and every body in a project that had a grandmother or auntie, they had a garden. They were not far removed from sharecropping. They had a garden. Right now I'm involved in a wonderful undertaking 
and it's called uh, Spaces for Opportunities. It's in South Phoenix where, you know, low income and medium income people of color live. And uh, there's some land, it's probably about, I don't know, 10 acres of land, I don't know, it might be more. And there's people of color out there farming. And it's beautiful, it's like the United Nations. It's truly, it's, it's everybody out there, but people from India, from Pakistan, from Colombia, uh, from the Congo, straight from the Congo, you know, uh, from Kenya, from the United States, first generation Mexicans over there, you know, and what blew me away is that majority of farmers over there, I'm kidding you not, 90% are women. We, they're doing some serious farming too. We don't have tractors. The tractors will come and make you a road, but you got to get out there and with shovels and picks and holes and, and, and make your 90% are women, 95. And out of that 95%, I would say 55% are women of color. I mean, African-American women specifically are out there. So I think planting food and being close to the earth is something that's really close to the African-American community as a whole. Uh, when you go back uh, one or two generations back, perhaps these, you know, the millennials, uh, they're, they're, they're not with that. But I think ownership of land, I mean, cultivating the land and, and nurturing the land is something that's part of, I've been trying to understand that, should ask Will, it's part of something, the divine feminine. All these women out there cultivating the land. And I was out there the other day and two of these women, they were, black women, they drove up driving BMWs, you know, like not 2009 or 2010, BMWs, their profession, they got out and they was working this land. And I was watching these women working. These women be working hard, this land, working the land. And all these women be working this land. So I'm trying to figure, this must be how something with the divine feminine, this connection that these women have with the land, earth producing, nurturing. So my point is that I just want to say that um, the comment that the gentleman said may not be representative of whole um, the black or African American community in, in, in America based on my experience because I just know too many uh, people of color, not only black people, but Hispanic and uh, Native American. They just love farming, being close to the land. Good stuff, Melvin brother, man. Alrighty, Myra, you've been very patient, uh, followed by Ray, followed by Sarah. Go for it, Myra, sister. All right, Myra may be attending to one of her household duties. So let's go to Ray, followed by Sarah. And Myra, feel free to jump the queue whenever you're back. Go for it, Ray. Let me know if my audio kicks out. I was, it hasn't been working that well lately. You're super uh, clear now. Okay, good. Um, and, and my comment was in response to somebody. I think it's gone now. It might have been Angela. I was talking about Extinction Rebellion. And, uh, that's um, so in London. She, she's still here. So oh, at the, yeah. Okay. So. Um, and... Uh, Roger Hallam spoke recently, so I guess this is uh, we're talking about in the in reference to the the uh, COVID pandemic, and I was wondering if he's uh, made the connection between what Extinction Rebellion has been doing, which is you know trying to get attention, trying to get the uh, the government to give up their their ability to do the decision making ability of how we are going to deal with the environment. They want to have uh, citizens' assemblies and try to get that power shifted to people that we trust. And uh, doing it by, you know, break, uh, disrupting the flow of major cities in London, in New York. And now that we're engaged in the COVID crisis, we, we've been wondering how much does uh, Extinction Rebellion have to do to get the attention that's needed? COVID has shut down every road in a sense. And it kind of illuminates just how much uh, our governments are not going to give up that power of, of uh, 
making the changes that we need. I was wondering if he was acknowledging that. Um, I'm not um, saying that, the, that anybody shouldn't be supporting Extinction Rebellion. I think that it's absolutely important that we keep pushing until, you know, after the thousandth no, we get the yes. We need to keep asking. We need to keep demanding. But I want also activists to recognize that there's only so much that we're able to do from a, from a top-down perspective to demand, you know, our, our renewable energy grid. Um, and especially because the other solutions with agriculture don't require that, that kind of framework. So I know that they've resisted the message of, of animal agriculture because it's a, a, what you do after you, you get the power. Um, what, what Extinction Rebellion, um, it, they've literally had, the, the organization has had the wind taken out of its sails because of COVID-19. It was a civil disobedience model based on the civil rights movement in, um, in America. You know, that form of protest, going to prison, well, that's, that's not happening now for obvious reasons. What they seem to be doing, they're trying to take uh, the ideas of Extinction Rebellion forward. It, it had a big gain in terms of putting the six mass extinction on the map for people who hadn't really come across it before. A lot of people, you know, were, oh, they, you know, it came as a shock. They, they, they grabbed the attention and all that. At the moment, what they seem to be looking to is rent, rent strike. Um, a lot of people are in dire straits. I'm sure this is happening all over the world. But say um, in England, um, people, when, when the lockdown came about, people who were in vulnerable housing, like um, privately rented accommodation, they were being asked to leave, you know? And uh, all kinds of horrible things. And lodgers were being asked to, to leave. A lot of people, they can't afford their own place. They live in one room of somebody else's flat. The person who, uh, who is the, renting the flat or who owns the flat was saying, oh, do you mind um, leaving, you know? So they're looking at um, rent strikes, um, different forms of protest, but they, that they put out, and there are lots of videos, all you have to do is go to YouTube, and you see all the latest ones, just put in Extinction Rebellion. There was a really good one recently, Melvin, with a guy, he, he was saying it's all down to racism. It's, it's really, it's at the base of every injustice. He, he had a lot to say on that, on that subject. I think he'd like it a lot. Um, I can't give you the details about it, but yeah, um, Ray, basically, they're, they, they're looking for a new direction at the moment, Extinction Rebellion, just putting videos out. But don't forget, all, during when Extinction Rebellion was growing very rapidly, um, a lot of people got together and formed little communities. And my guess is all those people are still in contact, they're having conversations. But yeah, they've had the wind take out their cell because they can't go on the streets anymore. So I think there's been a couple of little protests with the youth strikes. Um, the youth strikes did a kind of distancing protest. I think it was in Trafalgar Square where they were two metres apart, you know, in a kind of laid out protest like that. You know, so they're having to rethink. Everybody's having to rethink everything. But they put, Extinction Rebellion put a lot of good things on the menu that hadn't been in people's consciousness before. And even if, if that's all they do, that, that's a good one. You know, that's, that's my view on it. Well, I've been rooting from them. Uh, and mostly because of this, I'm curious to see and, and observe how they tried to get that, that uh, power of decision-making from the, the um, governments and put it into the hands of, of uh, hand-picked experts, this concept of citizens' assembly, uh, because they recognize that the, the corporatocracy isn't going to give the... Uh, the, make the decisions that are needed in this in this situation. So, give us the power to make the decisions, or give the choose who we want to make the, the decisions. But the answer keeps being no, and I, that's understandable. It's it's part of activism that the answer well, keeps being no well, until we get a yes. 
Well, my experience, all of our experience um, in history is that nobody ever gives power, you take it. Now, I'm not advocating violence, but you take it. And, you know, if, it's, if the numbers are there, they've got no choice, you know. That's, that's the revolution game, isn't it? Yeah, that's the tr transgression. That's the taking is the is the taking of, over of of the streets. And my point, my question was that uh, whether he addressed that that uh, COVID nineteen has done what uh, Extinction Rebellion was doing in the attempts to try to grab headlines. COVID nineteen has all the headlines, and uh, it's, it's yet it's still. <laughs> yeah. How much is the government willing to bend? We're, yeah, we're, we're uh, watching it. Unfold live. But what I'd say, Ray, is go to YouTube, type in Extinction Rebellion, there's some really good talks they put out. I like the ones with Roger Hallam in. I, I find some of it a bit flaky. Some of the co founders are completely flaked out, in my view. But if that's not my style, but it'll be somebody else's style who will like what they've got to say. But the ones with Hallam in, I, I thought they were pretty good. And there's some recent ones, one particularly on racism that was. Worth, worth listening to. So they're good for a catch up. Well, we, we like uh, Roger Hallam. We would like him to talk more about his veganism. Same as, uh, um, I mean, there's a lot of vegan activists in the environmental movement that don't talk about it. And it's something that they really need to do. Should we ask him to come on here then? He's probably be more than willing. He's in lockdown as well, presumably. Should let's we let's invite him. him. Love to have him. I'll follow Definitely. through with that. I'll see, see where that goes. All right. Great. Thank you, so. Thank you very much. It, related to that, uh, it, it, um, you were talking about how Roger Hallam is, is uh, learned from different movements, and he talks about uh, following Gandhi's methods. But it's one of Gandhi's methods is to live your message to, I mean, the, the Kadi movement was all about um, his behavior and wanting everybody to follow him in that behavior. So I would apply that to veganism and say that it's very relevant. If he's following Gandhian methods, that's something that he's, he's uh, got to follow through all of it. Not, not just the parts that are politically safe and, and uh, get a lot of people on board. He has to say the V word. Otherwise, yeah, it's I, not part of the vegan movement. It's a powerful movement that yeah. he's uh, um, well, think, politically deciding to avoid. He is a vegan, and a lot of Extinction Rebellion uh, people are vegan. And a lot of them li literally live out the bins. They, you know, like um, there's one guy, uh, Lark, Lark Maxi, Dr. Lark Maxi, and he, um, he just got his food out the bins. You can get they put it all out, you know, the, the wasted food in London, and so the, all the sandwich places. So he, he's living out of the bins, you know. So there's a lot of people who really live it, you know. And they, intentionally, they, is that like the freegan movement? Well, it's it's part of it is to is to be as sustainable as possible. So if that food is being wasted, it's already used up this much fossil fuel and this much energy. So it it's it can be part of the whole movement. I'm not saying everybody's like that, but a lot of people do do that, and they, they totally live it. And they don't even, you know, they live in one room and stuff because they feel take, people taking up too much space. And um, I'm, uh, I agree with that. I do think, I, I think we have to reconsider space. That's why I'm not keen when I hear that Al Gore um, has a sort of mega mansion and he's going around preaching um, climate change. And that's why, oh, sorry, that puts me right off. You know, I don't, I, li I like you to live it, you know? I'm like you, I like you to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Salesh has a uh, standing invitation to Gail Bradbrook to debate. No, no takers yet? Are you willing to talk to anybody else at uh, Extinction Rebellion? Anybody. No, yeah, I could, I could, um, yeah, I'll give it a go. I'll just, just see who, who's, who's what I'm probably glad there is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, please have them take a look at the white paper and um, then they, they, they can debate it. Yeah, sure. That would be great.
All right. And that's an opportunity for you, Jamin, because you managed to get Selesh and uh, Ellen Savory together, and we had a, a great conversation. This would be a, a great uh, similar venture. Well, you and, know, all and really mm -hmm. people on the same side. Yeah, and all this is ultimately pointing to the same direction, which is what Melvin identified, which is that the Extinction Rebellion folks, even their leader who's vegan, has painted himself in a corner with the carbon emissions, fossil fuels narrative, right? And now can't even mention his own, you know, doesn't even, you know, so, so that's all about reductionist. The bottom line is we got to go at the whole of it holistically. There's no other way. Period. Yeah, I, 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 one, yeah? one, of my, one of my criticisms was that they didn't go into the aerosol masking effect. You know, it's like they stopped short of that. I don't know. There must, my view is there must be some kind of agenda about it that they didn't want to terrify young people or whatever. You know, they wanted them to arrive at it. So I don't know what the game was, but I, it's not something I think they should go into that. I noticed a couple of people who were involved in. Extinction Rebellion, like Kevin, I think his name's Kevin Anderson, Dr. Kevin Anderson, something like that. And he um, he he alludes to it, and, and Larch Maxi alludes to it as well. But it's kind of quickly talked over, you know? It quit, it, you know, blink and you miss that. No, you, you hit the nail on the head, so, which is that you don't know what kind of game they're playing, but the, the, the fundamental issue is that they are playing a game. Right, there's a game. Anything other than the truth, the whole truth, as Melvin says, right? If you're not dealing with the whole truth and you're not dealing with the whole, you're playing a game. And uh, that's what I propose that we not do here. And that to the contrary, we go straight at the whole um, with the whole system, health and healing, um, regenerative, remedi um, remediating, eco governance, vitality codes, the whole. And 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 let let Dr. Shelley Ostroff make the case herself directly. Anyway, I want to thank Sarah for being very patient, uh, and Myra. Just let us know when you're back. So, we, but for now, it's Sarah followed by Miles. Go for it, Sarah. This question is more for Dr. Rao if he's still on. Um, Melvin talked about the system and I know that Dr. Rao we don't like to use the word system we like to use the word process so I just want to say that you know just keeping it real like that just use we should try to get away from systems because the system that we are under right now doesn't even work so we should just try to go to processes or whatever way you want to look at it Operation Stone Soup is also isn't Operation Stone Soup supposed to because we're going to be feeding the world, therefore healing the world. Isn't the food the basic premise for explaining it to the world and not getting too caught up with semantics? Because is, isn't it supposed to just be in the, you know, you have the test city or whatever. I guess you do it in Phoenix for the K-Mama app, and then you do a press conference in, let's say, Brooklyn. But why would you want to call out certain communities? Doesn't that go against everything that Operation Stone Soup is supposed to be? Because when you give food to everybody, even if it's, you know, whatever community you're giving it to, whomever it's getting it, the food, they are going to heal because that starts the process. The food starts the healing process in it all is just a domino effect so i think if you try to say well we're gonna just focus on the these people or these people then you're maybe we're being racist by trying to say well we think that these people need i mean we know that there are definitely major communities like we just talked about navajo nation and we've talked about uh all the different you know children that have to get government food and yeah we want to help everybody but if we separate them that to me we're being even more speciesist because we're trying to separate everybody out and i feel like we sh I mean we already are speciesist we all we talked about this this morning 
even when we try not to be speciesist, we use speciesist language. But we're trying to get away from categorizing people. I thought this is just an all-inclusive program and we're not going to categorize. Maybe, in, maybe behind the scenes, people could talk about it. But I thought when you're doing a press conference, it's just got to be really simple. Just people cannot understand everything, all this. I mean, the whole healing health, that, that's exactly what the program is. I don't know if we need to explain that to anybody, though, because they're not even going to understand plant-based. They're just going to understand food, like we're getting food. And then all that comes with it. So I agree with everything you guys are saying, but I just think that for the sake of the operation, it should just be really simple and not getting, I feel like we're getting caught up in all these semantics and therefore we're not even able to launch it because we've been doing these calls every week and we need to just do it because people are starting to get back out in the world. People are starting to believe that I got to get back out in the world and I just I can't wait till the vaccine comes. I mean, it's just like, these people are going to realize that they don't need a vaccine when they're healthy and they finally get out of that, that bubble or that fog because they are not aware. So the food is going to nourish them enough that they become aware. And yes, there is racism everywhere, all over the place. There's racism in everything because we live in a systematic racist world where that's unfortunate, but we have to change that. So I don't want to bring back these old ideas. I want to try to say this is the way to move forward to how we solve these dividing, all that us are divided because I'm like a white woman and someone's a white man. Therefore, some, I don't always assume this, but there could be people that think, well, she's white. She doesn't know what I've gone through. Of course I don't. Of course I don't know what anyone has gone through. But at the same time, we can still all work together to reach the common goal. And then all the little pieces behind the scenes can kind of like just substantiate it and bring it up to where they, once they realize they're getting better and they feel good, and they're being nourished. Everything kind of, I think, kind of goes after that. And then you don't really want to create a new system of anything. You, they, people will change on their own, just my opinion. So, I mean, I know what, like I bring up controversial subjects sometimes, but you know, it has to be talked about because I feel like maybe I don't want to be part of this group after today because it's starting to feel like, wow, what direction are we going in? I thought we were on the way to get this app released and getting this going. And like, we all know what the problem is. We know that we need to feed the world, but this is just a way that yes, it's going to work in our mind, but I believe it will work because we have the group that knows how to do it. Maybe it's just taken to this point to have all of these people that come from different backgrounds and you've got engineers, you've got, you know, everybody here has their own innate ability to make this, you know, succeed. But I don't think that we need to make it so complicated because the people we're feeding, we don't want to dumb them down by any way. This is not trying to dumb down the population, but this is just trying to say we need to think about when we were going vegan, how we were, we didn't know. And this is just... We don't even want to try to t teach them right now. We just want to feed them. And then everything comes after that. So I, I feel like we just have to keep it really raw at the beginning. Because then they're going to be like, well, what's your interior motive, you vegans? You know, you weirdos, blah, blah, blah. You're just trying to get us on your agenda. But we really need to go in there with, no, we really just want to feed you. There is no agenda. Because the agenda, like Melvin was talking about with the eco-governing is that's what we're going towards, but that's what they'll be assuming or kind of taking on. It will all make sense to them once it's revealed to them that they can remain in one 
body on this earth and they're not going to die from eating vegan food because most people are afraid of vegan food. But if you just tell people, you know, like when they say what's vegan, it's like, well, have you ever heard of an apple? I mean, I don't want to be rude to people like that, but it's like, seriously, vegan has been around since the beginning of the world. It's just other things, unfortunately, control and power got in the way of the vegan world, kind of took over the vegan world. Now we're trying to reclaim the world in a way. So I don't think we need to really create anything new per se, but just give what we have, the gifts and abundance that we have. We want to share it with everyone else because why should we be allowed to have all this amazing life force, but then let everybody else suffer? I mean, people not even having water just boggles my mind. Like they don't even have water. Like, what is that? And then people will realize that they'll connect like the animals. It takes a while for people to, to get that mindset. You know, it's not like when I went vegan, I already knew, oh, the dairy cow gets taken from the mother and you learn all of this. This is acquired learning. And most people that are vegan don't even know. I was on a breakout room last night with seven other vegan activists and they considered themselves like really strong vegan activists, but all of them, except for myself, had been in a slaughter, I mean, had never been in a slaughterhouse, had never went in, and to bear witness because that to me is something normal that I do on Sundays and Wednesdays, but that is not what 99.999% of people in this world do. They would never go to a slaughterhouse, no matter what you say to them. They're just not going to go there. We need to be realistic. But if you give them a donut, then they love it. They don't, you don't need to, it doesn't matter. It needs to be whole food plant-based. I realize that, but my point is that they don't understand. Unfortunately, I hate to say that, but it's the basic human person doesn't even have the emotional intelligence. So don't expect them to have the understanding that we're trying to get them to the next plateau. We just need to try to feed them. And then everything, just like it did for us, right? It did it for us. We have to know that they'll gradually, they just haven't evolved. That's all that I wanted to say, but I don't want to tick anybody off, but I just feel like separating groups, maybe not the best thing, but maybe I just don't know. I don't know. No, I, I think you do know, Sarah, and I, I'd like to address what you said first and before I pass it to Silas, I'll let Silas address the systems, whole system versus creating a new system. I think those are two different things, but I'll let Silas, who's the systems expert, address that. And Melvin, I, I see you got some follow on you want to do as well. But the first thing I want to address is when you said, you know, I may not come to this group after today because I see dot, 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 right? So I want to take that and I want to work with you for a moment, uh, Sarah, if I may with your permission, and um, not to put you on the spot or anything, but my, m where I'm getting at is we need you here. And if you see something that's off, right, or that's not working, or, or broken or anything, please don't go away, right? Because what you're seeing here is the furthest thing from a rigid, hey lady, this is how it is, if you don't like it, there's the door. Okay, this is not that. <laughs> Okay, you see what I'm saying? This is the opposite of that. Because you know what? You just made, you know, you know how was I saying like Melvin, you just boom, boom, boom. These tumblers just keep clicking in my mind when I hear Melvin speak. You made some tumblers click. And here's what I have to say about that. Whereas I might have said, hey, we're focusing first on, you know, the most deprived communities, da, 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 and here they are. No, maybe behind the scenes, and you hit the nail on the head, behind the scenes, we say, psh, psh, hey, Sarah, Melvin. Silas, don't, don't tell anyone, but I hear that the worst cases are happening in, you know, community, neighborhood ABC in Brooklyn, okay? Period, okay? So we're not gonna, we're not gonna rub it in their faces that they're the hungriest, but you know what? Let's send the trucks there first. But, you know, don't tell anyone. Psst, psst, got it? Wink, wink. That's it. Simple. Look, we're doing the right thing. We're, what are you gonna do? Take the food to the, to, the, to the houses of the wealthy in Brooklyn first, right? Some wealthy, obese people. Come on. They, their pantries are full. I guarantee you their pantries are full. Uh, no, we're going to go to the ones who are hungry first. But again, we're not going to rub them. So see, see, Sarah, this is an example. You just contributed to me and to the whole process, right? So we need you here. And we need you to speak up, not go away. And if you have anything to say about that, please say it anytime. 
Uh, again, I don't mean to put you on the spot, um, but it, it looks like you're, you know, anyway, up to you. But uh, I, I would love for you to stay here and I'd like to do anything I can to encourage you to stay and keep coming. I know Melvin had his hand up and I promised Silas some space and I see Melissa has her hand up too and Miles, Miles has been waiting. So I'm kind of getting pulled around here, but Melvin, I'm gonna let you comment. And then uh, Silas and of course, Sarah, you've got priority. Um, and then uh, Miles and Melissa, go for it, Melvin. You're on mute, Melvin, I'm gonna unmute you. Whoa. Wait, 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 Melvin, you're like muted, 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 muted. And it just, I tried to unmute you and it didn't work. Try, try unmuting oh, yourself. Okay. There you go. Whoosh. Okay. Okay. I want to piggyback on what James said. Um, please don't go. This is for me. This is a form where we can have disagreements. I don't know any way you can make progress in a personal relationship or at school or on your employee if you can't have disagreements and work through them and find a way to make it work. I just don't know where it's going to, how you can do that. And this is a healthy place to do it. You know, I've said things to Jamin, Jamin pushed back and I, I accept that. And I said things he accepted, you know, everything Salesh said, we don't take it, we don't swallow it off. I've given, I've given, I've said things to Salesh and he said, okay. You know, so what you're saying, we hear you. We hear you, please don't go. You know, this, this is what we talk about, healthy communication, healthy dialogue, where everybody is respected, everybody's voice has some value, has some validity. And one of the things about what I, my understanding is that going into Brooklyn, we are not personally going to go in there and do a jack. The people in the community, they're a grassroots organization. There's churches, there are, 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 are a farmer's market. There are people who are growing their food. There are the strong, vibrant, grassroots organizations in, in Brooklyn who are doing the work. We're not going to do jack. We're just bringing a model, really. So in terms of whole food, we took, my idea is that the people who are on the ground, who are really doing the work, who are doctors, who got PhDs, who got MBAs, who are sharp people who are really got enough food on their plates, but they're committed to the community, who, you know, they're not suffering on the same level as the people that they are working with suffering. My thought with whole health healing is that we have to have this conversation with that group, not the masses getting on things. Hey, we talking about whole health healing. You're right, because they just want some food in their belly. They just want some clean drinking water. They just want a roof over their head. And they don't give a damn who give them some food in their belly, really. Whoever give them some food, that's where they're going. That's like when Trump cut those checks. People don't like Trump, but they said Trump. Black people call him Trump. A lot of black men call him Trump. Give me my check. So the people that we want to serve, which are the most vulnerable populations, and I think it's to be transparent and clear about what we're doing, I think it's important that we consciously identify the most vulnerable population and talk about that. Racism is an ugly thing, but racism does not have its roots or its dynamics in individual relationship. It's a systemic historical problem to really get at racism. And for the population that we want to serve the most vulnerable, I can assure you that if we went to the Navajo Reservation and we got up there, if Jamie went up there and said, hey, we want to bring some good food and all this to you, they're going to look at him like it's crazy. They're going to think it's a game. But if it was another Navajo person from there, went there with the same thing Jamie said he wanted to do, and Jamie was standing behind, beside him, they said, okay, we'll listen. Because he's going to talk their language. It's important, just like with police brutality. We can't talk about police brutality and leave out racism. Say, oh, they're just brutal people. We, we can't, you can't talk about police brutality. And brutality. When you talk about uh, uh, um, inequality, when we talk about the food disparities, when we talk about hunger, 
income inequality. We cannot leave out racism and talk about it. That's leaving out the most, one of the most important factors. And also, if we want to resonate with the people we want to serve, we want to help, we have to connect with them. And that's what they're thinking, racism. But we know that racism is just a symptom of what they're suffering from. And we know to get to that, we need to make a whole systemic change, just like we were talking about. We were talking about the, the movement over in London. The guy started out with, I'm just going for carbon emission. He put himself in a corner. We need a whole system approach. So what I'm suggesting is that when we're talking to the grassroots people, those, those leaders, the community grassroots leaders who are really on the ground, who are really doing things, who are very effective, that we say what we're talking about is, you know, whole system and approach, but we're talking about remediation and regeneration of the environment, the stone soup. We're talking about a whole system approach, not just bringing them some food for one day. You know, anybody could bring them some food, a bag of food for one day. That's what the welfare system and everybody doing. So we're talking about a whole system approach and, and having this conversation with the community leaders on the ground there. That's where I'm coming from. And, and among ourselves, you grab whole system and you grab it well and you and you really right. If you get up there trying to tell some people who are hungry, who don't have uh, don't know how they're gonna pay their rent next week from a whole system approach, they don't want to hear that crap. They don't want to hear it. They just want some food and some water and to get their rent paid. But the people who they will listen to, if we could help them, I don't want to say help, if we could uh, 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 collaborate with them and share with them what we think is a solution to this whole problem. That's the problem that we have right now in America, what we're trying to fight. We all have identified the problem. But if we could come under one umbrella, if we could come under the, um, um, the understanding that our individual and collective responsibility in this world is how we can contribute to a healthy ecosystem, to a healthy governance system. That's what I'm talking about. How can we do that? If we can start having that understanding, that conversation, that dialogue, the thing that we're talking about, boundaries with ideology, with race, uh, with, with, with religion, and all of that stuff will melt away, will melt away. And that's one of the things I like about the whole system in eco-governance is that it really is a, it's a, it's a, it's an organizational principle for rapid social regeneration and change that cuts across ideological, racial, cultural, and all type of barriers. You know, as James said, when he said he wanted to do the black and white thing, what did I take it to? We can't just put it in that context. We have to see it holistically. We have to see it within the context that there were Africans who were who, 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 who colluded in that. We have to tell the whole story. So as Jamin said, he said what I said, and I just got it from somewhere. We have to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as we're going forward. And to do that, I think it's important that we look at everything from a whole system perspective. So and once again, I want to thank you for um, your sharing. And you're absolutely right. We cannot go with these broad philosophical things to the people. We have to keep it really simple and bring it to them. But we also have to understand, like Will said, Will said something that was really resonated with me. We're looking back 5,000 years ago and say, well, they were just, you know, thousand. We we're just suffering and living miserable lives and they didn't understand things. Well, to tell you the truth, they were doing pretty good if you look at it. So we can't say because they don't have our education and awareness that they cannot grasp whole systems health and healing, that they won't come to this. We, 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 we have to trust in them and their, their wisdom, their knowledge, that they can understand whole system health. When I, when I share this here, one core concept, this one core uh, principle with people. I don't care what this status is. Aspire to do no harm and organize. I say this is what I try to live by. Aspire to do no harm and organize my thoughts, my words, and action 
with that which is nourishing to the entire community of life. Everybody seemed to understand that. You know, I said, so I said, I mean, what I'm talking about, brothers, that I'm not hurting dogs, I'm not hurting rats. I want to live my life in such a way that I'm not hurting anybody. They like that. So I think that is how we frame it. Anybody can gather around it. And that's what we're trying, trying to come up with. What I'm suggesting that we come up with some type of coherent narrative that we can all gather around. And thank you again. Thank you, Melvin, brother. All right, uh, Silas, of course, uh, jump in anytime as our main leader here, and Sarah, uh, likewise. Uh, Miles has had his hand up, and uh, Myra, please let me know when you're back. If you're back, go for it, Miles. Silas, did you want to speak at all or at this time? Did you want the floor before I go in forward? to respond to what was said? Uh, me, I was gonna just address Sarah's question about process versus system. And because um, uh, uh, system to me is like the, the framework, you know, the scaffolding that we built uh, to create this new organization, whatever it is, you know, um, one way of living, whatever way of living it is. And the current system is, is about funneling wealth to a few people. It's organized around that principle. It's about property ownership. It's about um, animal exploitation. It's about uh, uh, colonialism, racism. You know, all these isms are built into the system. It's all systemic. It's the foundation. The foundation itself has it. I mean, the, the scaffolding itself has it. And so, um, so the, the, everything does have that scaffolding, whether we like it or not. You know, it is there. Even a system where we say everything is decentralized, there is some method to that, whatever that method is. It could be that there is an organizing principle around you know, whole system health or whatever. So that is the scaffolding that you have put in place for that uh, to work. So that I would call that the organizing principle of the new system. That would be the scaffolding of the new system. And it could be some measurements that we do, like the Aquarius currency that I'm talking about. Some measurements that we have to do to make sure that we are within limits as we work on this earth. So that to me is the system. And the process is how do you then organize within that framework, within that scaffolding. Okay? So both are necessary in any given uh, way of organization. Thanks, Miles. You're very welcome. So uh, I'm on the north side of this imaginary straight line that runs from the Great Lakes to the Pacific Coast in Canada. And I would be 100% on board with everything that's going on down there on your side of the border. Um, but I'm on this Blackfoot Nitsitapi Confederacy territory in Alberta. and one of the things I'm wanting to attend to is so much about what Melvin was talking about. And, you know, I'm going to have to actually go and capture in writing so I can cite Melvin, what he said, because uh, yeah, for me, I'm, I first have to get a handle on the fact that we need healthy governance here in Canada and address the racism, the systemic racism that has kept the indigenous people out of our governance. And they are, they have been reduced to 0.2% of this country. Well, the territories are thankfully under control of Inuit people. They have their own territory, but on further south, south in Canada, um, the, in, the natives, the indigenous, the Indians are restricted to reservations. And that's just, it's, we got to ad address that. So the, and they have the wisdom. And Melvin was saying that they have for healthy governance. It was a matriarchal, matrilineal system here um, 200 years ago in, when the indigenous people lived here. And Sarah is an example of a sister leading the way. Sisters leading the way. I am quoting a, an indigenous lawyer named Pam Palmiter of Ryerson University, great 
would know her. Um, and uh, that's her that's her statement. And I would say that that's what we need to do. I'm, I may get criticized, but I think it is like the sinking of the Titanic. It's women and children first. And, you know, we are to serve. Men are to serve. And the sisters need to lead the way on all this. You know, we've got great people here, several of us engineers. Um, Ray's a media expert, Sarah's a business professional, and, you know, so there's, there's the logos, logical brain in both men and women, but um, it, it's time to address racism and sexism and put the sisters leading the way. Now, what I want to also say is I, we are in a psychological, on, ongoing psychological operation, and we had some fun when we had coffee when we started off here this morning. Jamin spun some old rock and roll tunes and I put on the link, this first girl band, rock girl rock band in Canada, 1982 called Toronto. They have this song, Start Telling the Truth. And I put the lyrics version up there. But with respect to this psychological operation, here's what concerns me that we need to always be aware of. So this individual that I know, a very nice woman, young lady, a mother, she posted in a tweet. She said, though I'm not vegan or vegetarian, I feel quite convicted by the conditions these animals have to live in. These are living human beings and should not be condemned to shoe boxes. And I look at the replies. She got a lot, quite a few replies, 16 replies. 14 promoting oh you know meat's good for you or yeah you're right we could do a better job uh, you know um but you know buy your meat from the ethical farmers and anyway basically 14 replies either promoting meat or perpetuating meat and dairy only two suggesting yeah she should be concerned about these animals. And one of them was mine. And I put in Dr. Rao's Twitter handle saying, you know, consult this white paper on climate change. But anyway, is, is the, how's the vegan uh, world 2026 media survey <laughs> group doing? Because, uh, you know, how much of this is going on? I'm getting YouTube ads funneled my way, promoting steaks and barbecues and, like literally restaurants that are specializing in serving meat. And it's like, why is it, why am I getting bombarded with this stuff? So what's going on? Start telling the truth. Thank you. Yes, Melissa, go for it. Yeah, um, I, I would love to ask Sarah you a question. Um, I'm just wondering what um, triggered you in the conversation specifically um, around, it, I don't know if I totally understood what you were responding to and I'm wondering, was it to the comments about racism and equality, equity, not equality? Um, rather than just focusing on feeding people. Um, so I just wanted to ask that first, if you could help. Yeah, that's correct. Because under my, under my under, according to my understanding, this is supposed to be a way to simplify, even though it's not simple, it's supposed to be a really concise way. Like this is supposed to be, you know, we already have a gazillion places that feed people. So that's why I'm saying, like, I thought this was something that is, that's kind of like, it's universal. So it's going to work, you know, because you're going to have press conference about it. Everybody's going to want to get in on it. But I think explaining it down the road is fine. I just think at the beginning, it doesn't need to be so complicated because then it just gets too complicated. It's not that people can't understand it. It's they just don't want to understand it. They just want to, they just want to eat. 
at this point, we have to remember that we're going to, we're entering into a totally different way of like life as we know it. And we can't go back to the normal way. It, we have to try to adapt to a better way. And this, this is a way to adapting and how to feed people. And it can be about a, a lot of other things too, but then you just get bogged down and then it just becomes the same thing that everybody else is trying to do, but they made it too complicated. I felt like this was something that wasn't going to be so complicated. And now it seems just becoming, we got to do it. That we got to like make sure we get to these people, these people, these people. I thought that when Melvin did say what, one of the things I thought he said was really good was, oh yeah, well, the, like the Navajo people will accept food from like Navajo, you know, like people that they relate to, that's fine. So that's great. But at the get go, I think we should just put it out there and then all the details get done. Like I said, like behind the scenes or whatever, because at the end of the day, when you get your Amazon package, you just want to get it. You don't really care that the driver had to drive somewhere and drop your package here and then it was in a locker and some other driver picked it up here and then it you don't need to know all the logistics most people do not care about the lo logistics unfortunately um that's that's all i was trying to really to to really make my statement on that one yeah thanks that was uh, really helped to clarify and um so Jamin, of course you know your feedback would be marvelous but i just want to say what i was getting from the opportunity that Jamin's created with the block party and i think there are multiple um pathways or multiple things going on on block party so i think there are projects happening that are very um thoughtful and um um and are about taking action so the one is feeding people that's just basic straightforward feeding people <laughs> so i don't think that that isn't being said that that's you know it needs to be complicated at least not from my perspective um, and understanding and the other is cooling the planet and then there are all these other tributaries which are talking about systems that humanity set up for thousands and hundreds and thousands of years that we're addressing. And so I think what's interesting um, about the block party is it's a, um, a platform that gives us the opportunity to really explore these together. So, you know, explore how to feed people, keep it simple, explore how to cool the planet. I don't know if that's simple, but you know, let's, let's give it a go. And then I think there are these um, deeper things that are kind of like, you know, when you're sick, and you, if you just go to a doctor, he's going to give you like antibiotics, but that doesn't necessarily get to the root of the problem. That could help you feel better, of course, when you're sick, but you know, you might get sick again. And so I think Block Party is offering us this opportunity to get to the root causes of all these issues that we're facing, which we're also trying to create solutions for. So I think it's an essential part of the conversation. I just wanted to add that. But we know the root problem. Animal, like we said this morning, like even though Ben, I think one of the people on the call is pre-vegan and he didn't really agree that much, but he, I don't think he realized that everything he does hurts animals. But when you eat animals and when you use animals for entertainment or you wear animals, that's the cause for everything. We're trying to fix everything that we ourselves did. So it's basically this huge mess and we're trying to frantically clean it up and only X amount of per people percent wise actually really care to clean it up. And unfortunately that's just the way it goes. But yeah, so that's just my take on it is that we already know what the problem is. I mean, that's what I was thinking. We knew the problem is it's an using animals in any way, shape or form. Well, um, Sarah, I'm really glad you brought up cleanup um, because for me, there's two parts to clean. The two most urgent parts to cleaning up the mess are very, very simple. Number one, stop killing animals and stop abusing animals in any way, exactly as you articulated. Stop that. That's number one. Number two, reflect sunlight back into space so that we can cool our planet and at least have a chance of survival, right? Um, those are the two. 
And, you know, our first go at bringing the two together was vegan reflection. Now I think we're at a, we're at a higher level still. And I think we're, we're getting closer and closer to the mark where we can actually then do the press conference. And I'm 100% with you, Sarah. You know, weeks have been passing, and um, we we need to put this we need to put this matter to bed is the bottom line, and we need to do it as quickly as possible. I'm right there with you. So please stay with us, Sarah, so that you can help us put this to bed, get it done. You know, make the press conference happen. And uh, but we've we, and the only way that I know of that we can do that, the most efficient way I know that we can do that, is by having this conversation. The quickest way. Myra, you had your hand up quite a while back, and then I think you had to step away. Um, but uh, anyway, Sarah, if you're complete, great. Uh, if not, please jump in, uh, followed by Myra. Yeah, I'm good. I'm going to, I need to drive somewhere. So if I'm not on or I have to get off, I'll be back on when I get to my location. Sounds good. Sounds good. Great. I just Thank have you, to switch Sarah. devices. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Thanks, Sarah. All righty. Myra, go for it. Yes, I've been waiting for a long time. <laughs> and I actually didn't leave. The thing is that I, because I had my camera on, my, my battery was draining more and more and more, and I had to connect it and turn off the camera, but I was listening. And at the same time, I had to do other things. But I, uh, in a way, I complete uh, agree with Sarah. This is, I believe this is our 15th uh, meeting through our um, block party. And I think it is an amazing place for to have this type of gathering, with no doubt. Um, however, uh, there is something that keeps on coming to my mind. Um, everybody keeps on, I'm not gonna say everybody, but most keep on talking about the, uh, what is it called? The meeting over there in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, the where you, you guys want to call the media and all this. Brooklyn each. Brooklyn each. Okay. My question is press conference. Oh, the press conference. Yes, the press conference in, in New York. So my question is, out of all of the people that are here right now, who lives in New York? Who will be in charge over there of making sure that this app is going to work very properly, that is going to be delivered to the most vulnerable, um, and just other things that amplifies for any type of app to someone to be supervising exactly the way we want it to work. From my understanding is, um, I mean, New York, it is the epicenter for almost everything uh, is probably the world capital. Um, and it captures the attention whenever something happens. Like for instance, this crisis, well, it ended up because it's overpopulated because people live in high top buildings. Well, yes, it got hit really bad with the crisis. I've noticed that a lot of people like always, they abuse of the system. Um, and I'm going to say the system here because it has been and it's, it's still going to be. Um, and I mean it in a way that many people have right now the privilege of uh, signing on for unemployment. And they're getting paid by the government. They're the government is mailing to them unemployment income that is way more higher than what they already had as working, their normal income that they had. So now what happens that the people now, they're abusing of the system in a way that a lot of people they're filing for unemployment, even though they know that they can be working from home and be gaining uh, an income that, that it can feed them and have a roof, the most necessities. Um, I, my heart is heavy with a lot of communities. One of them is definitely the Navajo community. We know here in Arizona, the Navajo community has been getting really bad hit by this crisis. These people, they, um, 
like Sailesh was saying, a lot of these people, they don't even have electricity. They don't have clean water. When I used to have horses, from one street to another, you can see the big change going on the reserve and then going into Lehigh. Let's say, for example, Lehigh is a small town where there's a lot of rich people. They have land, big lands, big farms. And then you go to the next street and there's the Indian reservation where those people, they're so limited. And I think to myself, when I used to drive my horses over there, why is this people, this was their land. Uh, why are they, why do they live in this type of conditions? I mean, is this just, is this the way they like to live? Or is this is the way that we put them on to live? And I mean, we, the people that colonized America. Um, natives, Navajos, people of color, undocumented people. Undocumented people, they don't have access to medical. They don't have access to be getting a, 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 any type of government fundings. These are the people where my heart feels really heavy because they are really living day by day. And I think that we should not want to be with the conference thing on an epicenter. Sorry, it looks like my phone is running out of battery again. The New York conference, uh, even though New York is the epicenter for everything, I feel like at this very time, we don't want to be the epicenter for nothing in the, a place where it takes epicenter for everything. We want to be the serving people. We want to be the people that are going to be helping with vegan boxes, with plant-based foods. And I honestly feel, regardless whether you guys want to start this in New York, but I do feel like this is something that has to be happening in every state of the country. And we have to be focused also, me, Silas, Jackie, uh, Melvin, we are all here in Arizona. We can all become, to, we can all get together and deliver the boxes personally. Create some type of fundings where communities help communities. And we are present here in Arizona. We're not gonna be blind in a, in a, in a state like New York where who's gonna be supervising all of this process. We want to get the, we're so focused into getting the attention of the media. The media don't want to listen to us. They don't, they don't want to know. The elites, they owned the media. We don't, we don't want to, we, our attention doesn't have to be towards them. It has to be towards the poor, the people of color, the natives, the undocumented people. We can care less about the media. We see this girl from CNN always talking and having her shows and how amazing it is her show and, and, and all the news that she brings. But she doesn't get the attention of no big media. We're not going to get the attention of them, zero. We're not. I, we, we will. Myra, if, if I may, if I may. Okay. If we get the borough president of Brooklyn What's his name? Eric Adams? I forget his name. Help me out here. Um, whoever remembers his name. But he is vegan. He's an ex-cop, retired yes, cop, police that's officer. that's the guy. Yeah. Eric Adams. Uh, African-American. And he's written a book on veganism and how that healed his ailments, his underlying health conditions. I think diabetes. I forget what else. But anyway, um, I haven't read the book. But uh, So imagine we get Eric Adams. Will Tuttle, right? Dr. Silas Rao, Dr. Priya Naik, right? We get a bunch of heavy hitters and we say, listen, Eric, if, if, look, here's the thing. Uh, my suggestion of Brooklyn gives us, you know, something to work with in terms of let's get this thing written up and sent to Eric Adams and let's, let's contact Eric Adams and say, listen, we need to talk. We want to feed everyone in Brooklyn and we want to know if you're interested. 
right? <laughs> uh, or, if, or if we should take our project somewhere else. But we need to know, we want, you, have, you have the option now. Ball's in your court, yes or no, right? That'll get his attention. And then he'll talk with us and we'll say, look, if you want us to do it in Brooklyn, here's what we need from you. We need you to be 100% committed and we need you to call the media. If his office calls the media across the river in Manhattan and says, look, we're gonna feed everyone in Brooklyn, guess what? The media in Manhattan will come. Look, they called me the Bill Gates of Bud. I had the media eating out of my hands and I was selling them ganja, right? You know, feeding people is exciting. It's as exciting as ganja, okay? So it, people will come. This is my department. Myra, I, I'm an expert in this. You, you, I, I trust you saw the president of Vicente Fox press conference. And if not, please watch the whole thing all the way through Q&A and everything. That changed the course of history, period. And we're going to do it again. That was seven years ago. And I've had seven years to think about how I'll do the next one. I'm like an animal in a cage ready to come out and pounce. So let's get it on. But let's, but, and the way to get it on is right here, right now. Let's continue to have this meeting. Let's not leave this meeting until we've got this sorted out. Uh, back to you. What, Mara, are, next, then, what, are, what, are, what are we waiting for? And, and I love about what Melvin said on this. <laughs> no, here's the thing. Here's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for you and I to finish this conversation about do we do it in Brooklyn or do we not do it in Brooklyn? Right now, you, you've, you've said, hey, maybe let's not do it in Brooklyn. Okay, we're having the conversation. We, we can't, we, we, we gotta no, have the conversation. I'm not saying let's not do it in Brooklyn. I'm saying this is something that has to be done in every state of the United States and if hopefully it can go worldwide. This is the intention to end worldwide hunger. But what I'm trying to say is that while we have this type of meetings every Friday, people are hungry, Navajo, nation, uh, Navajo communities, they're suffering, undocumented, undocumented people they're running uh, out of sources to live in a daily basis people of color are still getting sick so i mean i understand that we cannot change the world from one day to another we cannot that's impossible but we are taking just a little too long to do the conference in new york we have to do it let's let's make a, a deadline let's do it maybe no longer than June, or no longer than Maine, but let's just do it. Let's get a hold of this guy. If this guy is so important, why hasn't he done nothing for Brooklyn? Well, it could be because we haven't called him yet. Once we call him, he'll say, this is the ticket for me to do something for Brooklyn. Here's, and they're offering me a pretty sweet deal. I call the press, they'll come here and feed everybody. I'm in. Melvin had his hand up, followed by Sarah. Um, go for it. And, and by the way, look, it, it, it's, it's fair game. Listen, go back, rewind two, three weeks. We were, we were talking about Louisville, Kentucky for a while. Then we were talking about Cork, Ireland. So this is a moving target. You know, the, the point is, let's have the conversation. Let's reach consensus. Um, Will Tuttle was talking earlier about scientific consensus. Let's reach a really kind of elevated form of consensus around this, figure it out and land this flying saucer, right? Because we're just hovering right now. Kids are starving and we're hovering, talking, right? So we got to land it. Okay, so let's be efficient about it. And if you have a proposal, say it, right? If you have a complaint, maybe hold off on issuing the complaint until you got complaint and solution, right? I don't have a complaint. I love to be here, but we do need to have a deadline. No more no, than this. No, no, I wasn't talking to you, Myra. I was talking to everyone, right? Anyone who has a complaint, think about it before you say it, because if you think about it a bit longer, I bet you can come up with a solution. And that's what we need here is solutions. We need to bring this thing. We need a place to land, right? So for example, if somebody says, oh, I don't like Brooklyn because of this, this, and this, please don't say that. Say, I don't like Brooklyn because of this, this, and this, and I offer this other city instead, right? That's what I want to hear. I don't want to just hear a, a com I mean, I'm, I'm saying for the process to move. It's not about me. It's about the process. And uh, that's what I'm suggesting to make it more efficient. Anyway, uh, who's next here? Was it Melvin? Melvin, and then Sarah. Yeah. Uh, Maya, thank you for your passion and your insights. Uh, resonate very well with me. 
you know, we can do this on two fronts simultaneously, Brooklyn and the Navajo. And I think that's, when it, I think that's, you're right on spot. When we first started talking about this, my thought was doing it in Arkansas, where they have those hog farms and those black communities. It was, it was just really impacted by that. You know, and you write about, I think you write about the, the, the media, uh, even though that guy's the mayor of, of um, Brooklyn and he wrote a book and he's a vegan, but I, I would doubt if he wanted to shake the system up. I, I doubt if he would put his mayorship online to do something really bold that might mess with McDonald's. So he started making with messing with McDonald's business, uh, he'll get some phone calls. So I think you write about not worrying about the big media attention. Uh, but I think we could do this here on, on two fronts. I really like what you saying about the Navajo reservation. We get like you, me and Jackie, we here, we got Zoom, we got this technology. Uh, we could do it on, we could do it on two fronts, but in, in regard to going into Brooklyn or any community, we cannot personally go in there. We have to get in touch with the grassroots people there who are working in, in Brooklyn. And as I said, there are a lot of, of uh, a, a strong grassroots community-based organization that's in Brooklyn that's doing what we're talking about doing. So it's going to take some logistics to get in touch with those people to set this up, to do the truck movement and all that, everything. So I feel you about a deadline and we talking and talking, but I think all this, this talking is really good because Sarah really brought out something that made me more conscious, made us all more aware. And I hope she's still here and she don't leave, you know. So this dialogue that we have in, 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 in your, in Sarah too, is saying, let's do some, let's put some action. Let's get some action. We've been yaggedy, yaggedy, yaggedy. Let's, let's do something. I, I feel you. But we cannot definitely go into Brooklyn on our own. We have to collaborate. We have to build relationships with people, organizations on the ground. And they have to run with the same thing, the Navajo Reservation. We have to hook up with the leaders there, with the people there, to do this, I think, I think we could probably even make a bigger and faster impact in places like the Navajo Reservation with technology, because we could start hooking them up with solar and food and water, and I mean, really quick steps. But you know, Jamin, he's an engineer and all. We can start impacting real quick because they are a sovereign nation, you know. But we have to go in there and get the chiefs, get the leaders on our side. I, I don't think that I don't know if that. That may not even be hard, you know, to, to do that, to share with them our vision and how this can help them become more self-reliant and independent, you know. And like you said, they already uh, um, uh, uh, have had a system of self-governance there, you know. So I think we might be able to do this on two fronts. We could bust it out in, 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 in Brooklyn and also the reservation on the same day. You know, we got, we got people, because when we do it in Brooklyn, I would hope that it'd be people from Brooklyn speaking and not Salesh and not Jamin. You know, maybe he could be a side speaker, you know, or, or a speaker, but the main person is gonna have to be a face that the people in Brooklyn know, that they know, that they trust, that they have a relationship with. And I was speaking, I was thinking of, of, of uh, uh, what's her name, D, D the, the, the Puerto, Puerto Rica, Puerto Ricana, who, who's the uh, uh, a congressperson there. Ocasio, is that yeah. Ocasio? Cortez? That's the point. That people will listen to her. We have to talk, we have to get somebody with credibility. She don't have to be a vegan. But I was thinking, you know, that's what I'm thinking about as we're going forward with it and trying to put it on the ground, trying to operationalize it. It has to be people from the community who are operationalized in this, not us, because it won't go anywhere. So that's part of the process and the logistics that we think through. If we want to go to Brooklyn with this, who could be the mouthpiece for this? I think Ocasio would be good. Maybe that mayor would be good, great. But we have to have Brooklynites out there in front of the inside of whoever saying whatever they want to say, but it has to be as root, come from them, collaboration with us, feed Brooklyn, 
but you know, our intention is not just to feed Brooklyn, but to, to hopefully bring by whole system change so we don't have to be delivering food to them permanently. And especially with the reservation, my heart bleeds for the, my heart been bleeding for the reservation because I'm a native here. I've seen it. I, I've seen the, the destitution, the tragedy the, there. And it, it just, it's just so frightening. It's just so saddening. And so maybe we can do a, um, a, 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 a opening here with um, stone, stone, um, stone rock here. Stone soup. Stone, stone soup. Maybe we yeah. do a stone soup opening here too. You know, maybe yeah. we can do it on two fronts. So, and that, that's exactly what we need to figure out here. Uh, Sarah has her hand raised, but I just I want to address what you're saying, Melvin, um, because what I'm seeing here is there's a divergence in perception about what Operation Stone Soup is, what we'd be doing, what people in the local community would be doing and all that. I, and because there's a divergence in perception, what I'd like to offer is, uh, and I take responsibility for that, let, let me articulate very briefly what my, my current perception of Operation Stone Soup is, what we would be doing, what Brooklyn would be doing, and what other communities would be doing. But let's co-create it, right? Mm -hmm. let's, let's not imagine what it isn't. Let's co-create it so that it will be what we want it to be. Um, so starting with, um, so the press conference in Brooklyn, if it's going to be Brooklyn, we would need to have um, you know, a bunch of a bunch of Brooklynites involved. But what I would say is probably the best approach might be a strategy where we say, look, we're reaching out to multiple communities to basically to launch on the same day. We're going to do simultaneous press conferences in multiple different communities. And um, we are looking for, you know, one or two or three communities to take the lead. Uh, you know, Mr. Borough President Eric Adams, we'd love to, you know, we, we, we extend an invitation for you to be one of the lead communities, if you'd be interested, uh, let us know, right? Meanwhile, we put out a whole bunch of feelers, a whole bunch of invitations to a whole bunch of community leaders, mayors, city councils, right? Uh, NGO uh, leaders, community leaders, right? Um, and, uh, and just you know, people involved in all facets of this from, from you know, food, uh, you know, um, food pantries, food, what do you call them, food kitchens, uh, to, you know, community gardens, et cetera, et cetera. So the people who are already boots on the ground doing this kind of stuff, you know, salvaging food that would get tossed and, and you know, delivering it to those in need, et cetera, et cetera. So let's so let's start to put this together as a multi-community thing. And then that way, whichever communities organically and on their own volition say, whoa, we'd love to lead on this. We say, great, let's talk. Right. And we interview them because the, the reality is we, um, I mean, look, there's two ways we can, we can do this. One is that we can have a multi-city press conference simultaneously. And each of us is just in our own home. Right leading the simultaneous press conference that's happening in a bunch of cities at once. Meanwhile, there's a separate Zoom video conference channel for each city, and we have an organized um, plan for who's gonna be in what city when, so to speak. To be in a city means to be in the Zoom video conference for that city. So Silish might visit 10 cities in two hours, right? I might just stay in one place if it's Brooklyn, for example, if that's where we're, you know, putting most of our focus. I don't know. That's what that's for us to figure out. So let's 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 work on that. And in parallel, let's work on the message. I say the message should be, um, you know, hello, humanity. We are here uh, participating in a movement to feed everyone uh, whole food, plant based, immune boosting diets delivered to their homes and in the process, re redesigning uh, food networks and in fact, redefining food. Boom, you know, just like, whoa, right? Didn't that just hit you right in the solar plexus? Like, mm! sorry for the violent reference, I take that back. Didn't that just stroke you the right way? Let me put it that way. Um, you know, so, but let's, let's get that core message boiled down. Once we do, then we find a way to expand that into, and then in 
into the following, which is basically centered around CSI, collective superintelligence. Okay, as we get everyone together working on food all around the world, we could create a planetary network, right, worldwide, you know, that, that looks out for each other. So if there's an abundance of grain in one region and a famine in another, well, let's get giant ships, fill them up with that grain and ship it on over as quickly as possible and get it to the people who are hungry, right? So everything from these massive, you know, lifts, drops of food to community gardens in Brooklyn to everything. So, so a, a burning question will emerge when people are listening to all this. And that question is, well, who the hell are you? Well, we tell them who we are and we tell them who's involved. And most importantly, right, we're the first ones to, to hold such a press conference. That's who we are. And in the world of marketing, it's better to be first than it is to be better. And that's exactly the opposite of everything you were ever taught. You were taught to be the best you possibly can, even if it takes longer. Marketing, it's the opposite. It's better to be first than it is to be better. And this, this gets to what Sarah was saying. Hey, you know, let's just do this. The opportunity is now to do it. I really don't want to go to my grave having missed that opportunity, right? So let's, let's do it. Um, uh, so, you know, in terms of the, the, the message, so it starts there. As we build a planetary network, we build collective superintelligence. So we start with food. We build two collective superintelligence, and we use that collective superintelligence to solve the rest of our most urgent problems, one of which is just red hot urgent, white hot urgent, and that is none other than exponential planetary overheating. And we need collective superintelligence for that. So for me, it would hit, the, me the core message should hit on those three, boom, 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 right? You know, within a whole, a whole, um, how did you phrase it? Whole system health and healing, uh, you know, framework. But then again, to Sarah's point, even though we'll, we'll be living and breathing that framework and that'll undergird everything we do and provide us guidance and really great structure, maybe that's not the first thing we say at the press conference. Maybe we say, hey, we come out guns a blazing, say, again, pardon the violence, but we come out saying, hey, we're here to feed everyone, right? in very specific ways. And that is the most inclusive way possible. That's where we're launching in 10 cities at once. You know, we, we, we blast our way in. We be the first ones to do an international press conference, multi-city, international. But even though it's multi-city and international, um, there is one city where like, it'll physically, we'll be physically doing something. Or do we do physical th operations in multiple cities? I don't know, but one thing's for sure, we need to build a network of people who are boots on the ground in the business. So we need to do outreach to those folks. And what I would suggest is that we schedule some blocks of time. Well, notably, we've already got 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. every Friday, and we've got whatever time we need on Tuesday as well by default. We just inv we invite all these folks to join those meetings. And all the information for both those meetings is up on radish.org. We invite, 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 and get, get those people in and share the message with them and learn from them what we have to learn from them. Alrighty. Now, Sarah, you had, oh, shoot. Okay, Sarah, let's see if she wrote anything. Um, okay, Melvin had to go for now. Looks like Sarah dropped off, but she was waiting. Melissa's got her hand up. Go for it, Melissa. Yeah, um, so I guess this is going back to kind of comments that are coming from Myra and Sarah um, and even Melvin. Um, so my question, Jamin, to you is um, why not launch this big or small in multiple locations and just start feeding people? Since that, you know, and I think, I don't know, Myra, if that's what you were saying earlier. It's like, is the press conference really important? Like, isn't it the feeding the people that's really important? And so why not start it for us? It would be here in the Northwest. For Melvin, Myra, and Jackie, um, it would be in Arizona and Silesh. 
um, hopefully we'd find someone in Brooklyn to run Brooklyn and just start multiple points of feeding people in our local areas. Thank you. All righty. Um, welcome back, Sarah. Um, meanwhile, and welcome back, Ugo. Sarah had her hand up. Sarah, if this is a good time for you, feel free to jump in. Followed by Myra, followed right by Emery, followed by Jamin. Go for it, Sarah. Oh, Sarah, you're on. You're on mute, Sarah. And if you're driving, don't don't even worry about it. I'll 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 take care of it. You don't. You don't no, it's okay. Yeah. I just wanted to see if you could hear me, but can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. So, uh, just to go on what you said, Jamin, that's I did raise my hand to try to make make what you just said. You know, yes, we're planning on doing this in all cities and everywhere and everybody we want to participate, but we do have to start off in a one city or two city, you know, with the press conference, because that's what nobody's ever done is the big press conference, I guess. It's, most people just have like commercials on TV or like ads about dogs starving and kids starving and you send a penny a day or whatever. So this is on a bigger scale and it's gonna work, etc. And I think Dr. Rouse came out with the K Mama app, he said he was gonna be testing it out in Phoenix, or maybe it was Tucson or Phoenix or Tempe. But what's the I think that was the that's why I was wondering what's the next step because I thought he was gonna do the test pilot and uh, try it out in Phoenix. And then we were gonna go either with Louisville or, you know, now we're looking at Brooklyn, but let's try to maybe uh, materialize a, a place or, you know, get it locked down based on what Dr. Rouse, you know, I thought we were gonna test the app. That's really what the question is supposed to be about where we're gonna do this. Yeah, that's what we're that's what we're figuring out right now. Um, I and I and actually to that point, I want to answer a quick Melissa's question real briefly, and then uh, pass it on to Myra and Emery. But Melissa said, "Why not just start feeding people?" Um, if we broaden our perspective and our scope to considering that everyone who's involved in feeding people is one of us, then we started feeding people, you know, hundreds of years ago, and we. Are feeding people now and we do it every day right so if we take that perspective going back to miles point from a couple hours ago about you know defining the problem that that's 80 percent of the work if we take the perspective that we are a much bigger we than we've been considering ourselves up till now and that it's already happening then the work is connecting the network in conversation building the collective intelligence and as we build this network it'll become very very clear which cities are red hot raring to go to do a press conference and you know get the attention of the world right because that's what's missing right now is the world is waiting for us to hold a press conference that gets their attention and that invites them to participate the world is waiting for the invitation so they can jump in and participate with us we just need to make it happen um with that I'll pass it to Myra, followed by Emery, followed by Jamin. Go for it, Myra. Okay, sorry. Um, oh my goodness, what was I gonna say? Okay, while well, we're trying to figure out uh, this situation and, and getting together here, I've noticed that there's a religion called six I don't know how to pronounce it. It's spelled S I. I don't know. Six. They are a uh, religion. Seek. 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 Yes. And they are beauty. They're doing something beautiful where they cook every Sunday. Uh, a lot of women they get together. They start cooking different type of soups. And these people, they're vegan. From what I understand, I'm not too 100% sure. I don't know if they're oval to vegetarians or completely vegan, but I do know that they're cooking healthy meals and they put them outside on tables. And then there's like big caravans of cars picking up a meal per day. And I think that's an amazing work. Um, I do want to ask you, Jamin, 
like when you had the conf the 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 conference the media conference with Vicente Fox what was it gained that you because I haven't seen the video but what was what is it that you guys gained from that conference because my understanding is that the biggest elites that have contributed in intoxicating humanity damaging mother earth they are the owners of the media this is the reason why we never see in the media vegan meals we never see on tv to encourage people to have a, a healthy living style instead we see the media always commercializing about burger king mcdonald's and, and just being like buying us into being hoarders so what is it that we're trying to gain right now what is it that you gain with vicente fox and what is it that we're trying to gain with the media as of now yeah what we gained with president vicente fox at that press conference in 2013 and what we seek to gain now is in my mind fundamentally the same thing and that is two things number one the world's attention and that the world get the gist of what we're saying to them and number two that the world uh join us in a conversation right and um that's what we achieved in 2013 and that conversation became so powerful that it changed the course of history it forced the hand of the obama administration and uh, attorney general eric holder um, and uh, I've, I've discussed the details of that before and then uh, in parallel in the rest of latin america uruguay became the first country in the world to legalize cannabis uh, within a few months of their attending our three-day symposium in Mexico, also in 2013, July 2013. So um, what we seek specifically is to get the world's attention that there is a solution out there and we're doing it and they're invited to participate and they're needed to participate. In fact, we need everyone to participate and here's what it is and join us and here's all the information and the conversation is happening now and jump in. I mean, it's like, it's that simple. And I believe the world is waiting for such an invitation and the first ones to get there. Remember, it's better to, in, in the laws of marketing, and this is a marketing problem because we're trying to get through to people's minds. That's what marketing is, getting into people's minds, right? It's nothing other than that. Um, and we want to get into the world's minds. Law number one of the 22 immutable laws of marketing by Rise and Trout is, that it is better to be first than it is to be better. And so what I'm positing is that the first press conference or the first something that gets the world's attention, and I know how to do it with press conferences. I've done it a number of times successfully. I was, at, I was trained in that at Microsoft and also you know, was corporate strategy manager at Microsoft. So I had to put together the strategies uh, or work on the strategies that would become press conferences, right? So I've worked on it on different, you know, on, on different levels. And I, I know that it works, right? Um, there are other things that work, you know, jumping out of an airplane or something also works, but I'd probably die if I did that. So, you know, we want to do something that'll work, that'll get the world's attention. And again, the world is waiting for this. They're hungry for this. We don't even have to push this too hard. Um, we just have to figure out what we're doing. And that's what we're doing right now. So onward and upward. Um, if you have anything to add to that, Myra, please do. Otherwise, it'll be on to Emery, who's next in the queue, followed by Jamin. All right, uh, Emery, if you're ready, go for it. Thanks, Jamin. Well, I've been listening for a while. I'm there's so many components to uh, to this operation, and um, you know, I've been making observations uh, as uh, everyone is uh, chiming in um, with their concerns. You know, um, so many components. Yeah, I I think that uh, it would be nice to have. Uh, 
the creation of this invitation. And um, I guess, uh, I guess part of that uh, job will, will need to be delegated to, uh, to an individual uh, or someone who's participating so far who has that, that ability and talent to be able to put together a, a nice invitation that um, those of us who are participating can uh, can forward to uh, people that we could uh, discover, you know, with our research and forward them an invitation to join us. And, uh, you know, I think at some point we'll need commitments from these people who will somewhere down the line get involved and um, you know like like Sarah says you know we, we gotta take uh, uh, take take action get this thing on the roll uh, get this thing rolling now the ones that are already doing this there are plenty of those people and organizations doing doing what we're intending to do uh, at least the first part of it, uh, feeding uh, people. Now, what they're feeding people is doesn't fall into the same uh, perspective as what uh, we're trying to do with whole uh, with whole food, uh, plant based plant based food. So, you know, I I think that uh, uh, you know maybe we have to plan that out uh, a little bit better and uh, provide the uh, the initial plan there maybe go ahead uh, go ahead with uh, without these organizations perhaps i don't know maybe they'll get on board uh, but we have to at least appreciate the difference there and um, so you know, Brooklyn is fine. I think it's a perfect starting starting point. And um, you know, um, I've been I had something cross my mind that this is kind of like an emergency kind of situation. Now, maybe maybe there could be a way to get the militia, local militia, or uh, uh, something in the military involved somehow this is something we could uh, put our mind to and think about because uh, you know there's a lot of uh, power and structure within the military and militia and uh, we need to have some kind of a, a, a command post you know a command a central command for this operation you know uh, not to say that we can't develop that here on our own, but uh, you know, being that we will need boots on the ground, that that's an ongoing uh, job. That's an ongoing uh, thing that needs to be uh, planned out and organized. I mean, now, Jamin, you know, you know, most of us who are involved uh, so far as the 15th block party. And I think you're the you would be about the best person that has the the grasp of everybody's talents, you know. Maybe uh, you could consider uh, in the in the near future to to consider delegation of certain tasks that could be given to uh, some some people. You know, you decide. You you got a fair fairly good idea of uh, the abilities of cer certain people that are involved, and put it to you know an invitation to participate in that task. I mean we're not twisting anybody's arm to do anything in particular, but you know there's a point where we need to start delegating tasks, and certain jobs need to get done and um, you'll have to prioritize them and lay them out on some kind of a map where at least uh, those who are participating can envision the operation, you know? So uh, 
This is just a small tidbit here for now. Uh, good, good stuff, Emery. Thank you. I, I appreciate um, those suggestions. Uh, you know, my preference in terms of, you know, you, you suggested delegation of tasks. My preference is uh, rather that we articulate what the tasks are and let people volunteer for what really, you know, calls to them or they feel they're called to or, you know, whatever. Right. That's, that's my, that's my preference. Cause that way I'm not asking someone to do something that they don't want to do. Right. If they wanted to do it, they, you know, they could volunteer to do it. Right. And so I think, I think really what we need to do as a, as a, as a community, as a, you know, uh, as a community, that's what we are uh, as block party solution club, et cetera is get clear on what the top priorities are, put them on the table, and then see who's game, uh, if anyone, to, uh, to take on a given task or other, right? And, um, and those that no one volunteers for, um, let's, we just circle back spiraling style and come back to it and say, all right, what do we do? Thanks, Melissa, sweetheart, see you soon. Um, and uh, anyway, that's, that's my suggestion there. What, so what I would suggest next then, um, I, I wanna address a couple of points that you raised, um, Emery, and uh, also uh, read what Silas wrote before he took off uh, about 25 minutes ago or so. He wrote, I have to get going, but I offer to reach out to Eric Adams and the governor of Navajo Nation and get back to you by next Friday. See, that's a perfect example. You saw the need, we've been talking about it, you know, how do we reach out to these folks? And he said, okay, I'll do it, right? That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Now, likewise, um, we have a need to reach out to those organizations that are already feeding people, right? And um, I would encourage everyone to um, reach out in your own community where you are and identify those organizations that are uh, engaged in feeding people in one way or another. Um, and there's a, a lot of such organizations. I mean, this literally includes people who are managing community garden plots, people who have food banks, operate food banks. Um, you know, there's a food truck in Seattle that gives free vegetarian food away, right? Um, in the university district. I don't know if they're operating now with the pandemic, but anyway, the, the, it, was, it was known that they were doing that. Um, and you know, everyone's heard of these operations that feed people, right? Um, and uh, let's not limit ourselves to any one or even a small number of classes, right? If, if it's a real religious group that's doing the work, great. If it's a government organization that's doing the work, great. We want to hear from everyone. We want to talk with everyone. And what I think we could do, what makes sense to me is invite all these different groups to our, our meetings that we have every Friday, Saturday, the block party, and every Tuesday, the Solution Club, and invite these different groups, no matter where they are around the world, to join the network, to join the meetings, right? And we'll specifically encourage them to look on the schedule, which I will commit to getting done by, let me commit to that by Monday night, in other words, prior to the Tuesday Solution Club, have the schedule all mapped out for both the Solution Club and the block party. And um, if you have any suggestions on that, please send me an email is the best way to reach me with any suggestions for that. So, um, but once we have that scheduled down, that'll include blocks of time where we're bringing together these different, let's call them feeder communities, <laughs> right? And I'm using feeder in a multiple meaning 
you know, obviously they're feeding people, but they're also feeding us with information. They're feeding us with membership, right? Feeder communities. So we need feeder communities. And um, I think these feeder communities can become the backbone of Snack Bar, the social network of awesome communities. If you're feeding people, you're awesome, right? And uh, if you're in the conversation, you're even more awesome, <laughs> right? We want to we want to get people who are either who are feed who are feeders, and or in the conversation, either or or both, right? One or the other or both. Um, and that way, what we do is we bring together our community into a united planetary network of feeders, right? And that's when we start to uh, develop some significant uh, power, I would say, right? Not power for power's sake, but power so that we can apply that power to what we're setting out to achieve, which is feeding everyone, right? And doing the necessary things that we need to do to get there, including communication. But you know what? It could well be that by building out these, this community of communities, specifically this community of feeder communities, as we build out this community of communities, um, which then evolves into a collective intelligence, which then evolves into a collective super intelligence. Let me, let me just make a, let me step out on a limb and say that that approach actually makes a lot more sense to me because we would bring in so much intelligence um, into the mix, right? Um, that relevant intelligence, right? People who are actually feeding other people, that that's what they do, whether they volunteer, whether they get paid for it is secondary. The point is that's what they do, right? And so I think that really would become the backbone of, of the whole effort. So right now we're, we're like, we're, we're missing a backbone. <laughs> we're missing our backbone, right? And as soon as I said that, Jackie shows up. So now we got our backbone back. The backbone is back. And you know that we'll never be whacked. The backbone is back. Do you like the backbone? Boom, 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 boom. Anyway, that's from a rap song from the 80s. It is. <laughs> by, by the Fat Boys. Okay. Anyway, um, so Emery, is that your hand up or no? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, let me get Jackie back up. Let me get Jackie back up to speed. I think you'll love this conversation, Jackie, and we truly need you here. So <laughs> you did not come one moment too soon. Um, the here's here's uh, sorry. Okay, here's where we're at. We are evaluating whether to launch the press conference as an event in one city or multiple cities simultaneously, could be 10 cities simultaneously, right? Um, but with particular emphasis in one place. Uh, Silish has committed to reaching out to Eric Adams and to the uh, leader of the Navajo Nation in this next week, and he'll get back to us uh, by next Friday on the governor of the Navajo Nation. So Brooklyn, you know, <laughs> Borough President Eric Adams and Governor of the Navajo Nation. So Silas is reaching out to both of them. Um, and another thing that's that's come up for us is like, well, wait a second. Um, here, we haven't properly built out a community of communities yet. A community. What, what are the what, what's the community of communities? The communities are what we're calling feeder communities communities that are feeding people, right? Or involved in feeding people in, in one way or another. So for example, uh, Melvin, um, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, Melvin, but Melvin's involved in the community gardens. Uh, I don't know if you're volunteering there or, or you've just got your own plot there or, 
what exactly I'll let you speak for yourself, but you know, you're a part of a community that's feeding a com you know, communities because you're growing food, bro. And good for you. So bam, there we've got one member, his name's Melvin, right? <laughs> um, you know, in a very, in a much smaller way, um, Melissa and I have, have, have been helping out uh, folks here in, in this community, would, South Woodby Island. Um, so I know Silas is involved in feeding people. Uh, I know Jackie is, and probably most of us are. And um, the, Myra, but the point is, yeah, go ahead, Jackie. Myra is too, we're working together to feed people. Awesome, 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 love it. So, okay, so this is the beginning of a community of communities. And um, I'm thinking what we could do is put, get all these communities up on Snack Bar, the social network of awesome communities, right? Where if you're part of a feeder community, you're part of an awesome community. If you're feeding people, you're awesome, right? And if you're in the conversation, you're awesome. And if you're feeding people and you're in the conversation, then it's two scoops of frozen coconut awesome, right? So we're building out the social network of awesome communities. In fact, maybe that's what, what, what the invitation should be. We're building out a network of communities that's involved in feeding people and involved in the conversation. Here's the conversation. Yeah, um, go for it, Emery. Yeah, I just want to point out uh, just so that we don't uh, don't forget that uh, the app, the app part of uh, this project, that in itself is a community also of feeding communities, which is different than say the uh, the other communities that are that are already feeding people okay and not really with the same diet that uh that we are proposing but at least they are already involved in that in that work you know so th those are two different different types of communities i i would imagine the app is the app involvement with the app is a bit different than you know delivering boxes of uh you know of whole whole based uh plant uh, plant-based foods you know so because because with the app that's a preparation through restaurants and you know those other organizations that have the ability to prepare food. I don't know, there's a difference there. Over to you. Thank you, Emery, and welcome, uh, Tracy. Um, welcome to the 15th Collective Intelligence Block Party, and uh, feel free to chime in at any time, even now, Just, but no Hi. pressure. Hey, yeah, hey. Well, hello from Guadalajara. I'm I'm here because Hugo from 350.org Guadalajara just invited me and I don't know about you guys yet. So this is great to to meet you and see what this is all about. Pues bienvenida Tracy. Se habla español y qué bonita Guadalajara. Qué bueno por ti que estás por ahí. Por esa por esas tierras tan bellas. And uh we, we also speak we also speak English here so um, yeah we're in and we're in a, in a really cool conversation and with you here now it's perfect so welcome <laughs> all right well um, here's what I would uh, yes Jackie go ahead can you help me understand what the conversation was around what it looked like around the verse going just Brooklyn or versus doing multiple um, press conferences. What is, what did you discuss? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me first give maybe just like a two or three minute recap for Tracy, just so that she's brought up to speed. 
a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, Ugo. And uh, Phil, and, and Tracy, if you don't, don't hesitate to jump in with questions at any time. You're going to find this a very, very friendly, compassionate, loving, peaceful, you know, benevolent community, et cetera. <laughs> so just jump in anytime. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes we get a number of people in the queue right now. No one's really in the queue that I can see. Um, so, but so, okay. So perfect time for a recap. Okay. Um, and just jump in if you have any questions. So we're, um, big, big picture. There's a big conversation that's sorely missing in the world today. And then there are the outcomes from that conversation, which I'll give an example of in a moment. What I'm calling the conversation goes exactly like this. How do we save life on earth? And the answers that we're looking for can come in different forms, but, but essentially what we're looking for is a whole answer. And what does a whole answer look like? I've been calling it a hyper solution, but I kind of like the word whole answer better. But anyway, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, but a whole answer or a hyper solution consists of a whole set of solutions or a basket of solutions, right? Including a strategy that starts exactly where we are right now and takes us through multiple phases, stages, milestones up to our ultimate goal. Well, what is our ultimate goal? Definitely we want to save life, right? But can we be a bit more specific? Y yes, we can. And that's, that's a whole project unto itself. What is the goal? Um, and I'm looking at, so again, back to the concept of a hyper solution. Um, it's a bunch of solutions and a big strategy and all that, including what do we do for a second, third. And it's probably easier to talk about an example of a hyper solution rather than talk more textbook theory. Yes, Tracy, please. Would that be like the Green New Deal? That's a perfect example of a, of a hyper solution. Okay. That's a perfect example. Or the global uh, Green New Deal. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's a perfect example of a hyper solution. So uh, the, a kind, now here's a hyper solution that we've been working on and we're in the process of defining it right now. So, so what, I'm, what I'm not putting on the table is something that's just like totally cut and dry, defined, here's how it is, and now we're just marching forward. No. We are defining the thing as we speak. So uh, what is the thing? The thing has a name. Its name is Operation Stone Soup. So give me a thumbs up if you've heard the story before. Great. Pardon? The Stone Soup story, yeah. Isn't that a great story? It's a great story. Awesome. Okay. So we love it. And um, so Operation Stone Soup, as the name suggests, is about operationalizing stone soup all around the world, turning us into one giant stone soup community um, that is all about whole food, plant-based diets that are healthy and notably immune boosting, right? And when we are in times of pandemic, uh, we need to deliver those foods to people's homes so that they don't need to leave their homes and go out there and mix it up. Um, and um, we, I mean, and we're, we're, we're literally teetering on the edge of uh, serious societal breakdown, starvation, violence, um, and just, you know, collapse of society, all of which can be averted and needs and it all needs to be that needs to be averted uh, with great urgency um, through a planetary program to feed everyone right and so what we're now working on is how how do we get that started um, and of and very much of note is the fact that there are you know millions of such programs already in existence all around the world in everywhere everywhere from small neighborhood programs like Jackie and Myra notably work together to feed people in their community right and thank you so much for doing that Jackie and Myra and uh, so what we're what we're talking about literally when you just jumped on was building out this community of communities what we're calling feeder communities these are communities that feed people right? Large, small, doesn't matter the size, it just matters are you feeding people. 
and um, we're putting together a, a social network of such communities, um, which will be called uh, Snack Bar. Snack is S-N-A-C, which stands for the Social Network of Awesome Communities. And you're an awesome, you're an awesome community if you're either feeding people or in the conversation, which I talked about initially, uh, or both. Best of both worlds is both, but all are welcome. If you're doing one or the other or both, you're in, and we need you here. Um, we need to have the conversation, and uh, we need to feed people. Um, and so Operation Stone Soup is really, you could think of it in its most simple terms as a three-stage process, okay? Stage one is feed everyone. Uh, stage two, though one and two really happen in parallel, um, but um, since there is some degree of sequence to it, stage two is in the process of feeding everyone and in the process of this social network of awesome communities coming together and working together and collaborating in meetings such as this one and ultimately many meetings happening in parallel. Right now, this is just one meeting right? Uh, well, th this is the social network of awesome communities right here, right now. But, you know, everything starts somewhere. So here's where we're starting. And um, so stage two, and I started to answer what that is. Now I'll complete it. Stage two happens in parallel with stage one, which is all about food. So as these communities come together and work together and collaborate to build out all of the solutions, all of the plans, all of the strategies, all of the systems, all of the recipes, all of the community groups, volunteer groups, et cetera. Um, as we put together all the solutions that we need to feed everyone in the manner as des des described, um, including home delivery during time of pandemic, um, as we put these groups together and as these groups get to know each other as these communities get to know each other and truly becomes a community of communities that is hyper connected and brought together by a common love for people and planet right then we will form a collective intelligence um that will both both be just emergent, but it's also something that we're in the process of designing. And for more information on that, I would, would point you to radish.org, uh, my organization's homepage, where we talk about that. Um, and also on the block party page, there's a lot of good information as well about how we're, how we're, how we're uh, building out collective intelligence to evolve into collective superintelligence. So that's stage two is, is the evolution towards collective superintelligence where superintelligence, and there's a great 30 minute video there on the block party page on radish.org that you can check out about that. And um, so the um, stage three is as this collective superintelligence is forming and growing and becoming, you know, this, uh, this higher form of intelligence, a much higher form of intelligence than anything we've seen that's really terrestrial, um, human-based. Uh, and that, and then stage three is applying that collective superintelligence to the problem of cooling the planet in time. And there is a way to do that. Um, and it needs to be deployed very, very quickly. And it's called solar radiation management or SRM for short. And it basically involves reflecting a significant portion of the sunlight that's currently landing on Earth back into space so that it does not heat up the planet in the first place. We're essentially talking about dimming down the sun, but in a very targeted localized way uh, over certain portions of the Earth, including notably the poles, which are melting quickly and putting it in, in extreme peril um, but the biggest single risk of all with the planetary overheating is that temperatures spike so much that we have massive crop failures and are unable to feed ourselves. That would be the single biggest, um, you know, cascading, you know, so, in, uh, thing that would have m multiple cascading impacts. So that's the big picture. So once again, to recap, we have the conversation, how to save life on Earth. 
multiple different hyper solutions that are essentially competing or in some cases collaborating for how do we achieve that. Um, and one of those is Operation Stone Soup, which in turn has three stages. Feed everybody, go super intelligent as a species and apply that super intelligence to cooling the planet in time with planetary scale SRM, which from our current perspective might look like that would take a miracle. Um, but from the perspective of collective super intelligence, it's just another day at the office. And that's because of the nature of collective super intelligence, which is this emergent thing, which has been growing. Well, I'd say we haven't quite reached collective super intelligence. We definitely have collective intelligence and it's evolving very quickly, especially in the current context of the pandemic, which is keeping everyone at home and therefore on Zoom video conference much more than we used to be, way more than we used to be. And um, anyway, in a nutshell, that's kind of the big picture. I'm gonna pause for any questions from you, Tracy, or from anyone as to what I just highlighted there. Um, well, it sounds like what you're talking about is um, just sort of building a big network between different communities that are working on food sovereignty issues. And then um, when you talk about this reflecting the sun back, uh, I mean, is it seems like is that the only solution that you're looking at or is that part of a larger collection of solutions yeah 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 so l l let me put it let me put it in terms of, of of kind of an analogy let's say that there's some community in the desert that ha that has a whole bunch of homes that are made of wood and they're all susceptible to fire because it's getting hot the wood is dry you know it's just like a tinderbox um, oh, and 3% uh, of the homes are currently on fire, right? So where do we put our focus right now? Putting out the fires that are currently burning or preventing new fires from starting? Um, my vote would be to put out the fires that are currently burning partly because that's the best way to prevent the new fires from starting, prevent it from spreading. And so I pick that analogy because of the following. There's really two solutions to climate change, immediate short term and long term. Long term, we all know very, very well, right? It's, it's essentially the subject of the book Drawdown, uh, written by Paul Hawken. And there's a lot of different solutions, a lot of ways to both reduce emissions and sequester carbon that's already in the atmosphere. There's a lot of things we can do there. Um, and that's what I would put in the category of preventing future fires, right? But there are fires blazing right now that we got to put out, and that's the domain of solar radiation management. And the only way, see right now we're, we're, we're kind of at the knee of the exponential and exponential has three phases, flatline, knee, and then vertical, right? We, we were flatline for a while and yeah, there are people predicting going back to the, like literally over a hundred years ago saying, hey, we're gonna have global warming because of all of the emissions, but you, can, you didn't really detect it. You know, remember the good old days back in like in the 80s and every, you know, every day was like the day before, every year was like the year before. And then, you know, right around the turn of the millennium, <laughs> it started to become obvious we started to have some problems. That's where it started to get into the knee. Now it's rounding the knee and it's about to go vertical, okay? Um, Tracy, do you remember Monty Python back in the day? Okay, so remember there'd be like this, oh, like a chorus, orchestra, oh, they're playing music, blah, blah, and then ah, boom, this giant Monty Python foot comes down, comes down and uh, much more than rains on the parade, shall we say, stomps on the parade. Okay, we need the, so since this, planet, this exponential planetary overheating is about to go vertical, there is nothing less than a giant Monty Python foot that can possibly put out that raging fire which if left unattended will just go vertical in terms of, of exponential uh, expansion and draw down ain't gonna do nothing to stop that. Absolutely nothing. In fact, it, what, it, what draw down does, uh, if not applied properly, is it actually fans the flames. Why? Because of loss of global dimming. And if you don't know about that, I strongly encourage you to look it up type in, go to YouTube, type in Global Dimming Guy McPherson, and he'll give you a really tight recap of it on one of his videos. 
But the basic idea is we've got all these particulates in the air that are reflecting sunlight back into space, providing a form of SRM, right? Uh, not natural, uh, but also it wasn't intentional, right? It just happened. But as soon as you reduce emissions, you reduce those particulates and you have less reflectivity back into space, which means more sunlight is getting absorbed by the earth, not less. So I said that that's what happens if you don't apply drawdown properly. What's the proper way to apply drawdown? The best way is first do SRM now, cool the planet, and then do all the drawdown that you want. Because once you've cooled the planet through SRM, you don't have to worry about loss of global dimming. I know that's a lot of moving parts. And, um, you know, there's, again, I point to Guy McPherson, Professor Guy McPherson. He provides the best overall summaries to all that as well as a picture of the urgency. The urgency is beyond any words I could use. I'll simply put it in terms of months. We could, we could be seeing massive crop failures as soon as this fall, right? So the urgency that we have to do SRM um, is like on the time scale of months. But, so then why are we focusing on food first? Because if we don't focus on food first, two things happen. Number one, uh, we could go Mad Max. I assume you know you get the reference, right? Okay, we could go Mad Max pretty quickly. Um, and if we go Mad Max, all bets are off in terms of doing planetary scale SRM in time. Just forget it. Um, number two, by feeding everyone, not only do we not go Mad Max, right? But we create the perfect conditions for collective superintelligence to explode, a la phase two, why? By bringing together people who are already working on feeding everyone. That's one community, but then there's another much smaller community, which are people involved in what we're calling the conversation. And we need to bring both of these communities of communities together, right? People who are in the conversation like us and people who are feeding people like us. Mm. Or people who are interested in feeding people and want to know how they can participate or people who are interested in getting into the conversation and want to know how they can get in. This is the, this is the place to get into the conversation. It's a 24 hour weekly collective intelligence block party. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I should know this already, but where do I find this conversation? Yeah, so you go to radish.org. Here, I'll put it in the chat. And And then on the homepage of radish.org, there's a link to what at, at the very top, there's a banner to the collective intelligence block party. Let me put that in as well. Into the chat. Okay, there you go. So, um, and the links are there both for the this current 24 hour block party, which happens every Friday, Saturday. We start at six o'clock in the morning Pacific time uh, Friday, and we go all the way to six o'clock in the morning Pacific time Saturday. That's the block party. And then the Solution Club is on Tuesdays. Information for that is also on the homepage of radish.org. You just scroll down right below the block party banner, and there's the Solution Club. We meet every Tuesday from 11 to 7 Pacific time, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Pacific time. And you're welcome to all those meetings. And uh, anyway, that's, that's 32 hours of meeting per week. That ought to get you started. And, uh, and I mean, we're doing it so intensively because we have such urgency. I mean, we're almost dead. And this is like the final scene in the James Bond movie. And either we, you know, save the, you know, the airplane and the princess and whatever else, or, you know, we all just crash and die, right? So that's why we're, that's where I spend, you know, dozens of hours of my life per week uh fundamentally staying alive staying alive ah 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 staying alive that's what we're doing we're staying alive <laughs> we're still alive and we need to do a buttload of work if we want to stay alive and that's what we're doing we're doing a bunch of work here <laughs> so anyway how does that all how does that all sound tracy sounds very interesting Awesome. Well, welcome. Welcome. Well, um, yeah. So, um, 
at this point, I would propose, unless there's anything else that needs to be said or asked or anything like that, that we simply continue with right into the heart, right in the heart of the conversation where we were before you joined us, Tracy, and please stick around for the whole of it. And please stick around for actually the next 15 hours. Yeah, we got 15, 15 more hours to go. <laughs> go ahead, Jackie. Okay, I'm going to have to take a little break because I'm actually on deadline right now. So I just popped in to see what it's about and I will definitely check it out and I'll definitely see you down the road. Awesome. Awesome. Come back anytime, Tracy. Great to Thank see you. you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. You're yeah, welcome. I really appreciate it. You're Thanks. welcome. See you soon. Bye, Bye for now. And Jackie, oh, you know what? I'm going to need to stop this recording because we've been recording for almost four hours. So let me stop this recording and then we'll start another one. Sound good? Okay.